Thank you and good morning. Uh, the Committee on Natural Resources will come to order. Uh, the committee today is meeting to hear testimony from our invited witnesses. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at this hearing are limited to the chairman and the ranking uh, member. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be, be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the clerk by 5 o'clock today. Five, uh, if I hear no objection, so ordered. I'll recognize myself for, uh, for my opening statement. And I want to again reiterate my thanks for being here. Uh, today's hearing is really about uh, beginning the process of retracing the administrative step, uh, the administration steps uh, in uh, what many of us believe is the illegal destruction of Utah's national monuments. They need scrutiny, and the only way to provide that scrutiny is to go back to that decision-making process. Uh, today's committee is going to begin that process. In 2017, President Trump, Secretary Zinke, orchestrated uh, the largest public lands protection rollback in, Amer in modern American history. They stripped away many protections for more than two million acres of public lands. They ignored sovereign tribal nations who had a legal right to participate in these decisions and ignored local communities. We asked uh, former Secretary Zinke to appear before us today. He declined to be here. We have sent document requests to Interior on how these decisions were made. Many of these requests have yet to receive a response. Our information for today's hearing comes mostly from Interior's own internal investigation. We reviewed hundreds of pages of interview transcripts from uh, Secretary Zinke and his team. These in interviews do not clear the administration entirely. The Inspector General found from these interviews that Interior followed some process during the review, uh, but the IG did not consider whether this process was A, legal, whether it was improperly influenced, or whether it best protected public lands. If, when my colleagues read the full report, they will see the administration process was, was, as hollow, was hollow and improper. Industry was given special consideration through this process. Political actors and specialists decided how our public lands were to be managed, and the voice of the American people was ignored. Politics came before resource management, and politics came uh, before people's voices on this issue. Uh, I know that the uh, ranking member has indicated that he would like to invite for these discussions three former presidents to come and uh, talk to us about their monument process and why there's a perception that what they did was illegal at that point. I would, I would, uh, I would welcome that opportunity, but on one very, very important condition, that the current president, Donald Trump, be part of the f people invited, that we have four, four, three former presidents and one current president, because the crux of this decision is what the Trump administration did in rolling back uh, the monuments and what led to that decision. And no person is in a better position to respond to this committee's inquiries than the current president of the United States on those issues. Our tribal partners, the members of the Bears Ears Inter-Tribal Coalition, will come before this committee and tell us whether the administration listened to their voices. The concept of uh, protecting Bears Ears originated with tribes. The original boundaries were designated largely to protect tribal cultural resources. We will hear from business people, council members, and people from Utah whose lives will continue to be impacted by the decision. We will hear from a scientist who can explain the crucial periods in Earth in Earth's and our nation's history that will no longer be protected. The administration ignored them all. They chose to listen to extractive industries and their political allies. The choice has consequences. Uh, majority, the then majority on this committee did not want to face those consequences, and it's a shame that today it is the first hearing we're holding on this issue since the president's action. For, we, this committee will, will and has and will continue to, to give a place for voices that haven't been heard on the critical decisions that have been made. This, uh, the Antiquities Law it, Act is not broken, and our monuments and our public lands receive the broad support of the American people, and this committee uh, will continue to uh, respect that support and preserve and protect those places. 
The core of today's hearing is about how we got to the recommendation and the decision uh, to shrink those monuments. And if the focus is on Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante, it is because 90% of the shrinkage occur occurred in those two vital monument designations. And so the crux is going backwards. And, and where were the voices of people? Where, were the, where was this decision made? Because the question that this administration needs to answer, did the process lead to a conclusion or was the conclu conclusion made and then we contrived a process? Uh, that's the center point on this and uh, that is what I hope we begin with these hearings to begin to cl cl clarify and put a focus on how this decision got made. With that, let me turn to the ranking member for his opening comments. Thank you. So, Mr. Grijalva, after spending the month of February spinning our wheels with everything from opioid addiction to concussions in the NFL, I have to congratulate you because the last two hearings we've had on the full committee have actually been within our jurisdiction. So the one that Splon did that dealt with Marianas and Guam and employment, that's clearly within our jurisdiction was a good hearing. This is also clearly within our jurisdiction and it is a worthy topic to discuss, even if Ms. Gralva, the Democrats have put blinders on to try and narrow the focus, which will allow us to have a lot of conversation but not ascertain a solution to the problem. Because the witnesses that you're going to have will be claiming to be forgotten voices. There's truth to that. It's also not complete, but it is truth. Because everyone sitting as in part of the audience is a forgotten voice. Everyone sitting on the dais is a forgotten voice. And they are forgotten voices simply because the Antiquities Act, when it creates a monument using that act, only has one person who has any kind of voice in the process. There is no allocation for input. There are no solutions to be done in advance. In fact, the day that the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument was proposed, um, actually it was two in the morning, so I don't know if that's the night before it was done or the day of it's being done, and they were still lying about it happening. The chief of staff in the Clinton administration was surprised to find that there were 200,000 acres of school trust lands within that proposed area that they were doing that would take years going into decades to try and work out through the court system. All that was a surprise because they didn't understand what school trust lands were, nor that they actually were there, which would have happened if you'd actually done the process in an open and inclusive way. Every realignment, the realignment that Mr. Trump did, also was done by one person. I know the Trump administration tried to create a process to go by it, but the problem is there are no rules. There is no process in the law for either creation or readjustments, and that's part of the problem. I am very proud that the land package the President signed yesterday that we worked on in a bipartisan way solves this problem. We created four national monuments the right way. Bills were introduced. We had hearings. We talked about it. We debated them twice on the House floor, and finally the Senate got around to actually voting on it at the same time. That's the way monuments should be made, so we have established the process to go through that. I would like to ask unanimous consent to put a couple of items into the record. The first one is obviously the report from a hearing that was done at the creation of the Grand Staircase Escalante that this committee also did, which simply shows by the email train that was going through there, there was no input because the administration wanted to be the creation of that monument as a surprise. They did not officially study it because they knew, and it was stated in the emails, that there would be no reason to create this monument if you actually did a study. The purpose of this monument was purely political going into the presidential re-election campaign. And what better place to do it than Utah, where that president had finished third in the election before that time. It clearly shows to the Utah governor, the delegation, including the Democrat that was representing that area at the time, that the, the chief of staff, that the president lied, Secretary Babbitt lied, McKinty lied, even the president could not find that monument on the map when he was doing it. I also want to put unanimous consent to put an article from the Deseret News that goes through the origins of the Grand Staircase Escalante, which was done many years before it was actually, I'm sorry, the origin of Bears Ears, done many years before it was actually taken place finalized in the San Francisco boardroom where they debated on whether to have a Native American name or whether it would be not be able to be sold unless you had something that was cute. We have had since that time a great deal of spin on the history as groups try and, and increase their self-importance by saying they were involved in that process. If someone says in this process that the protection under the readjustment of President Trump lowers the protection level, that is a lie. 
if, as we put up on the board of it, eventually, the number of, of laws that still were there before creation of monuments and will be there after readjustment, and they say that's merely a red herring and doesn't work, that is also a lie. If we say, as Patagonia did, that the president stole land, that's clearly a lie. If we say there is no local input, what is done by the pen can be taken away by the pen unless you do it the way we did in the lands package by creating an advisory board for the, Grand, for the Golden Spike National Park that actually is put in there by legislation, given responsibilities, and will stay there until Congress decides to change its legislative intent. If we talk about the, re the readjustments being done strictly for extraction industries, that's pure demagoguery and also not true. There is, though, a solution to this problem. And one of the reasons we wanted the three people three of the four people who are still here who actually have the power to do this thing unilaterally to, to talk about it, there is a solution. We have dropped a bill which formalizes a process that does involve at getting input from everyone before the creation and if there is going to be a readjustment which has been done in history by presidents, then you also have a process of how that becomes and Congress establishes that process. This hearing is good because we should be talking about how the process of creating monuments ought to be done controlled by the legislature and how the process of readjustments ought to be done controlled by the legislature and there indeed is a bill. So indeed, if we're going to have a markup on that in a hearing later on, we actually included recommendations from the other side the last time we had a hearing on this. If we are not going to do this, this becomes simply a sham where you check the box and allow people to have their say and you go on from that. But if indeed we are serious about creating a process, this bill is the one to do it the way in which it can be done. I yield back. Thank you, and without objection, uh, uh, the requests are put into the record. Uh, let me uh, again, uh, uh, now we're going to turn to our first panel. Uh, committee rules, your oral statements are limited to five minutes. Um, your entire statement is, will appear in, in the hearing record. And then we have, we have evolved to this very complicated uh, system in front of you. When the light goes green, you can start. When it goes yellow, it means caution. <laughs> you have a minute left. And when it turns red, you finish your last sentence and we move on to the next panelist. Uh, with, with the subject today and the number of witnesses that we have on both panels, uh, the more time that uh, the members will have to uh, question and uh, discuss with the panelists, uh, the better off we're all going to be. So with that, let me uh, turn to our, our, our first uh, panel, the Utah State Director for the Bureau of Land Management uh, for the Department of Interior, uh, a career. Uh, professional in, in the department, and thank you for your service, uh, Mr. Ed Roberson. Good morning, Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Bishop, and members of the committee. I'm Ed Roberson, the BLM's Utah State Director. Thank you for the opportunity to come today to discuss BLM's implementation of Presidential Proclamations 9681 and 9682, which modified the boundaries of Bears Ears and Grand Staircase National Monument. The Department of Interior is committed to expanding access to public lands, to restoring traditional use opportunities, and increasing hunting, fishing, and recreational opportunities nationwide. On April 26, 2017, President Trump signed Executive Order 13792, which tasked the Secretary of Interior with conducting a review of certain national monuments designated or expanded under the Antiquities Act of 1906. In accordance with the executive order, then Secretary Trump, or since Secretary Zinke, excuse me, uh, submitted two reports to President Trump for his consideration. The first was an interim report specifically addressing Bears Ears National Monument. The second was a final report which provided an assessment of 27 existing monuments. In addition, to recommendations related to these monuments. The final report recommended creation of three new monuments and that the president specifically seek legislation for official tribal co-management authority on certain monuments. On December 4th, 2017, President Trump, taking into consideration the final report recommendations and with the support of the Utah Governor Herbert and the congressional delegation, signed two proclamations modifying boundaries of Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante. 
In accordance with the presidential proclamations, the BLM is preparing new land use plans uh, for Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante. BLM is also drafting new land use plan for the area excluded from Grand Staircase Escalante. In late March of 2018, BLM hosted scoping meetings in Escalante, Kanab, Landing, and Bluff, Utah to begin the resource management planning process to help us identify any issues, management questions, or concerns that should be addressed in those land use plans. Following the scoping process, BLM and cooperating agencies prepared draft land use plans which were made available for public comment. During the 90-day public comment period, the BLM hosted public meetings in Escalante, Kanab, Landing, Bluff, and Montezuma Creek, Utah. Also during public comment period, the BLM signed on two additional cooperating agencies, and including two tribes. The BLM received approximately 400,000 comments between those two planning efforts and is currently developing proposed plans in accordance with the cooperating, are in coordination with the cooperating agencies and taking those comments into consideration. The BLM has placed a specific emphasis on engagement with Native American tribes as part of these planning efforts. This has included offering cooperating agency status to every interested tribe, 31 for Bears Ears and six of these for Grand Staircase Escalante. As I mentioned, only two tribes have accepted this invitation so far. Uh, the BLM has initiated government-to-government -government consultation with many tribes that are not cooperating agencies. In 2018, the BLM hosted more than 20 meetings with tribal leadership, traveled to New Mexico, met with the All Pueblo Council of Governors, and met individually with the leaders of Pueblos of Acoma, Felipe, San Felipe, Laguna, as well as representatives from other tribes. Through these meetings and the correspondence that the BLM has provided, uh, to the tribes. We've provided information and updates on the planning process and received tribal input on the monument management plans. The BLM is also consulting with the tribes under the National Historic Preservation Act to determine potential effects on cultural and heritage resources. The land use plans that the BLM is currently developing will ensure proper care and management of objects and values while providing important access to the public for traditional uses. <coughs> The proposed monument plans, each of which, uh, of each monument, are expected to be released later this year. And I would be glad to answer any of your questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to uh, the Honorable Vice Chairman of the uh, Ute Indian Tribe. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, time is yours. Good morning, Chairman. Members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on President Trump's unlawful attempt to reduce and revoke the Bears Ears National Monument. My name is Tony Small. I serve as the Vice Chairman of the Ute Indian Tribe Business Committee. The Ute Indian Tribe is a federally recognized tribe. Our 4.5 our 4 million acre Ute Intent Ore Reservation is in northeastern Utah. Our ancestral cultural resources and sacred sites extend into the central and southern Utah and western Colorado. We became a member of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition to help protect these lands and resources through the establishment of the Bears Ears National Monument. The Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition is a historic gathering of the Ute Indian Tribe, the Hopi Tribe, the Pueblo of Zuni, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, and the Navajo Nation. I am pleased to be here with leaders and representatives of the other tribes. Our mission is to protect the significant and priceless resources making up the Bears Ears National Monument. During the testimony of the coalition tribes, we will be showing pictures of some of the sacred and cultural resources that were excluded from the monument by Trump's unlawful action. Many of these resources are also important to archaeologists. There is no question that these resources qualify for protection under, under the Antiquities Act. Congressional oversight of Trump's unlawful action is long overdue. He did more than violate the Antiquities Act. Trump's monument review process also 
violated the United States treaty and trust relationship with Indian tribes. This is no small matter. The United States was founded on treaties and gov agreements with our strong and resilient tribes. This was the beginning of our government to government relationship with you. Without these agreements, you would not be here. Or maybe, or maybe the United States would be a lot smaller than it is today. To ensure these treaties and agreements are upheld, the United States enacted laws, executive orders, and policies that require full consultation with us during all federal actions affecting tribal resources, including the Bears Ears National Monument. This never happened. Trump and former Secretary Zinke's monument review process violated all of these. Interior's own tribal consultation policy states that consultation is a deliberative process that creates effective collaboration, informed federal decision making, and the consultation is built upon government to government exchange of information and promotes in enhanced community communication that emphasizes trust, respect, and shared responsibility. None of this occurred. Federal records and emails show that Zinke was closely coordinating with industry, political, and non-Indian stakeholders in his reduction of Bears Ears National Monument. While he turned his back on our, our concerns, this is the Secretary of Interior who said sovereignty should mean something when addressing the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. Sovereignty does mean something. So does our timeless connection to the lands and resources of the Bears Ears National Monument. President Obama recognized this when he established the monument. He included us in the management of the monument. He recognized the best way to protect and honor these lands and resources was through tribal management techniques and expertise. Obama recognized that Indian lands and resources extend far beyond our reservation boundaries. He recognized that these important and valuable natural and cultural resources are best managed in partnership that would provide lasting benefits and opportunities. A partnership between sovereign nations, we support passage of S-367, H.R. 871, and H.R. 1050 to correct Trump's violations of the law and policy. These bills have hundreds of co-sponsors and would restore balance to Bears Ears. Thank you for your consideration of my testimony, Mr. Chairman and committee. Thank you very much for your testimony. Let me uh, now invite the Lieutenant Governor of the Pueblo of Zuni, uh, the Honorable Carlton uh, Bonokaki. Did I get it? Sorry. Thank you. Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Bishop, and respected members of the committee, I am Carlton Bawakati, the Lieutenant Governor of the Zuni Tribe and the Co-Chair of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. On behalf of the people of the Zuni Tribe, I want to thank you for holding this oversight hearing on the Department of the Interior's review of certain national monuments. In particular, this administration's unlawful presidential proclamation purporting to shrink the Bears Ears National Monument by some 85 percent and split it into two pieces. The Zuni tribe has almost 13,000 members, the vast majority of which live on tribal lands in far western New Mexico. Our reservation contains 600,000 acres. However, our aboriginal lands, as well as those of our 18 sister pueblos in New Mexico and the five tribes that compose our coalition, include the lands that comprise the Bears Ears National Monument. The Bears Ears region is an integral part of our history, traditions, and culture. It was part of our former homelands along the route of our slow migration through the southwest that ultimately ended in Zuni, New Mexico. Though we no longer live in the Bears Ears area, certain places within its remarkable landscape are referred to in our oral histories and in our traditional ceremonies, and we periodically make pilgrimages to sites there to honor our ancestors. Zuni has been actively involved in the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition since its inception. It is a unique coalition, one that has remained focused on our mutual interest in ensuring that the remarkable cultural and natural resources found in, on the ancestral tribal lands that comprise Bears Ears are protected and preserved. It was therefore entirely appropriate for the 2016 presidential proclamation creating the Bears Ears National Monument, commonly referred to as the Obama Proclamation, to 
to, to have established the Bear Deers Commission with representation for each of the five tribes in order to provide guidance and recommendations on development and implementation of management plans and on management of the monument. In contrast to the Obama proclamation of respect for the tribe's historical connections to Bears Ears, the current administration, through the Department of Interior, conducted a national monument review that largely ignored tribal interests and concerns. It appears that this so-called review was conducted with a predetermined objective of justifying executive action, action which we are now challenging in federal court to greatly reduce the area protected by Bears Ears National Monument so that excluded lands can be available for mineral exploration and development. President Trump's executive action would, be, would also substantially reduce the role of tribes in ensuring the protection of the monument's invaluable cultural sites and resources. Though once inhabited and used exclusively by tribes in the Southwest, Zuni recognizes that Bears Ears lands are now federal lands owned by all Americans, and we want its stunning landscape and the special, uh, special places preserved so that all of us Americans, including future generations, can enjoy it and learn about its unique past. It cannot be seriously debated that the five tribes have unique connections to, knowledge of, and perspectives on Bears Ears, and our per perspectives should, not, should be recognized and given meaningful voice. Unfortunately, the expedited planning process that the Bureau of Land Management and U.S. Forest Service are currently under conducting has not included many, meaningful consultation with us. I want to avoid repeating the testimony of the tribal leaders from the other coalition tribes testifying today, but I do want this subcommittee to know that we stand united and that Zuni supports their testimony. I also encourage committee members and staff to carefully read the Obama proclamation as it presents a thorough and compelling justification for the establishment of Bears Ears National Monument, as well as a carefully balanced approach for its management. Though we had frankly hoped for the protection of a significantly larger area, we accepted the reduced area of 1.3 million acres as a compromise but we are not willing to support proposed legislation that will reduce that area further or that will diminish our role in its management. Zuni is not a wealthy tribe and we do not send representatives to Washington often. I'm here today because our people care enormously about the Bears Ears National Monument. Together with the tribes represented here before you today, along with our sister pueblos in New Mexico, I respectfully express our collective adamant opposition to any executive or legislative efforts that would attempt to reduce the area of Bears Ears or the voice of tribes in how the monument is managed. Thank you for inviting me to testify and for your consideration of my testimony on behalf of the people of Zuni. Eloqua. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. And uh, let me introduce the Vice Chairman of the Hopi Tribe uh, for his comments, Mr. Vice Chairman. Good morning. Chairman Grohova, Ranking Member Bishop, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the importance of the Bears Ears National Monument. I am Clark Tanakongva, a member of the Rabbit Tobacco Clan, a United States Army veteran who proudly served in Grenada. I have the privilege of serving as Vice Chairman of the Hopi Tribe, and I am the Tribe's Commissioner for the Bears Ears Commission. The Hopi Tribe is a sovereign nation that today is located in northern Arizona. The Hopi Reservation occupies part of Coconino and Navajo counties, encompasses more than 1.5 million acres, and is made up of 12 villages on three mesas. Our ancestral lands, cultural resources, and sacred sites extend into central and southern Utah and western Colorado. To Hopi people, the Bears Ears National Monument, or Honmoju, in our own Hopi language, is spiritually occupied landscape. For example, the two sparrows near Bluff are Pekanghoyat, warrior twins. This land is a testament of Hopi stewardship through thousands of years manifested by the footprints of ancient villages, sacred springs, migration routes, pilgrimage trails, artifacts, petroglyphs, and the physical remains of our buried Hisatsino, the people of long ago all of which were intentionally left to mark the land as proof that Hopi people have fulfilled their covenant. Hopi migration is intimately associated with the sacred covenant between the Hopi people and Masa, the earth guardian, in which the Hopi people made a solemn promise to protect the land by serving as stewards of the earth. In accordance with this covenant, the Hopi katsina, badger, flute, parrot, bow, greasewood, bear strap, snake, tobacco, rabbit, and deer clans traveled through the, and settled it on the lands in and around southeastern Utah during the, the long migrations to, to, 
to uh, Tiwanasabe, the Earth Center on the Hopi Mesas. This connection to the Berzias is integral to the Hopi tribe, and that is why we have advocated for years to protect it, in part through the Berzias Intertribal Coalition. The coalition worked with grassroots organizations for nearly a decade to create the Berzias National Monument in order to protect its sacred and priceless cultural and natural resources. We advocated for 1.9 million acre monument, but ultimately, President Obama declared a smaller 1.35 million acre monument. Although the size of the monument was less than what we had hoped for, the Hopi tribe <coughs> was still happy to see that this sacred landscape would be protected from mining, looting, ATVs, and other detrimental human impacts. Unfortunately, soon, soon after taking the office, the Trump administration began an assault on national monuments throughout its, through a results-oriented review. The administration's review had a preordained outcome, which was a presidential proclamation that drastically reduced the Bears Ears by 85%. The president's proclamation exceeded the authority that Congress gave to the executive branch, which is only to create national monuments. Not to diminish them, the Hopi tribe joined with the other impacted tribes to post this illegal executive overreach through the lawsuit of Hopi tribe versus Trump. The Trump administration's actions leave numerous sacred sites, unprotected, for example, the perfect Kiva, which embodies the important cultural and spiritual connection that we have to Bears Ears, would fall outside the reduced boundaries. Kivas are still used in our ceremonies today. If you look at our tribal seal, you will see the resemblance it bears to the perfect Kiva. The tribe cannot stand by while our ancestral footprints are desecrated and destroyed by the illegal reduction of the monument. The tribe will continue to fight this battle in the courts, but also want to express our support for H.R. 871, the Bears Ears Expansion and Respect for Sovereignty Act. We want to thank Representatives Gallego, Gallego Holland, and 97 other co-sponsors for introducing the bill. That bill would not only protect the boundaries of the Bears Ears, but it would also expand to the 1.9 million acres like the coalition originally expressed, requested. I urge this committee to take up the, and advance the H.R. 871. Thank you again for allowing me to be here today. I am available for any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, let me now turn to Ms. Kathleen Clark, Director, Public Lands Coordinating Office, State of Utah, uh, testifying on behalf of uh, the Governor of Utah, Governor Herbert. Ms. Clark. Uh, Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Bishop, and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing. Governor Herbert has asked me as the director of his Public Land Policy Coordinating Office and his senior advisor on public lands to read his statement. He was unable to intend, but wanted to convey his thoughts on this topic. When I spoke to this committee a year ago about the revised boundaries of the Bears Ear National Monument, I em emphasized a point that I want to reiterate now. I believe we all have the same goal, to protect these treasured landscapes, traditional uses, and precious archeological resources. I'm concerned that we sometimes talk past each other and miss the reality that we all want the same thing. If protection is our shared goal, then use of the Antiquities Act was always the wrong way to reach that goal. First, the Antiquities Act allows a president to create a monument with no input from local residents, no input from those who are most impacted by land management decisions. Second, the creation of a national monument does not itself add to protections already existing in law, and in some cases may, um, may diminish their effectiveness. Third, and perhaps most importantly, declaring a monument doesn't provide any funding or staffing resources to actually enhance those protections. 
In fact, it may worsen the problem by creating a magnet for increased visitation without any commensurate increase in funding for signage, law enforcement, fencing, or other tools to protect the sensitive areas. Finally, desired protections become more difficult as the area reserved for a monument increases in size. If we really want to achieve the protections that we're all seeking, I'd like to strongly suggest two concrete actions for this committee. Excuse me. Now first, please reform the Antiquities Act and return to the original intent of the law. Allowing a present to speedily create national monuments that are the smallest area compatible with the proper care and management of objects to be protected. While we may disagree about the right size of these monuments, the lesson here is that the Antiquities Act is being misused. It is simply the wrong way to protect enormous expanses of land without adversely affecting those whose lives depend on that land. If you accept my challenge, Representative Bishop's National Monument Creation and Protection Act is an excellent starting point, requiring congressional approval for designations larger than a given acreage. If you want to play with the acreage threshold, that's fine, but I would think we could all agree that monuments of 1.35 million or 1.9 million acres is far larger than what was envisioned when the Antiquities Act was passed. Second, whether or not you reform the Antiquities Act, let's do our best to create protections legislatively rather than free decree. The congressional process as we experience today inherently brings voices to the table. Yesterday, the president signed Senate 47, which is a large land package that enjoys bipartisan support I believe that that is a superior way to move forward. Uh, it even creates uh, new monuments, uh, one in Emory County uh, dealing with the dinosaur. I encourage you to advance more such legislation. With respect to the monuments, I reiterate my support for bills sponsored by Representative Stewart and Curtis. The most enduring solutions to difficult problems are always those that are achieved through dialogue and the involvement of all stakeholders. There is simply no need for the rancor and frustration that accompany this debate. Thank you for the chance to submit my views. Utah stands ready to work with all stakeholders across the spectrum to find solutions that work for everyone. Thank you very much to all the witnesses and thank you indeed for your valuable testimony. Uh, the chair will now recognize members for questions, and under ru committee rule 3D, each member will be recognized for five minutes. Uh, let me begin by uh, recognizing um, the vice chair of the full committee, uh, the general lady from New Mexico, Ms. Holland, for her five minutes. Ms. Holland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Guazi hopa. I'm very grateful that you're here today. Thank you. Um, it's easy to get emotional about our natural resources and about traditional tribal land when you know that your ancestors have been there for generations and that uh, it's only because of them that you sit here today. It's because they were able to um, work hard to, to work through drought and famine and and that um, their intelligence and hard work and their vision for the future of leaving a legacy for their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so forth, that's the reason you're here. And I realize that that's a charge that you take on, that you have a responsibility to leave a, a just world and an environment to your grandchildren. So I appreciate you all coming so far today to offer us your insights on what Bears Ears means to you and what our national monuments mean to you because there's tribes all over this country 
uh, and perhaps they don't have a connection to Bears Ears, but there are many other national monuments that, um, that essentially hold the history of their people as well. So I thank you for being here. And um, Vice Chairman Small, thank you for uh, reminding us that without Indian tribes, uh, we, we, none of us would be sitting here today. There would be no United States of America. And in fact, we are sitting on Indian land right now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, long before it was the state of Utah and home to the ranking member or Representative Curtis or Ms. Clark, the land was home to native people. These people flourished on the land. They hunted and planted. They raised their families and worshiped in ways that were given to them by the Creator. These lands were their home long before they were anyone else's home. We have the descendants of those earliest people sitting before us today, and they travel thousands of miles uh, to talk about why this land is important. Uh, we have heard that this illegal el elimination of our national monument monuments, which I am seeking to reverse through my Antiquities Act of 2019, was for the sake of traditional uses. But I ask, how do we draw the lines around those traditions? Why is grazing considered traditional use but not subsistence? Why coal and gas extraction but not tribal religious practices? I agree with the chairman that one role of this committee is to lift up people's voices, but I wonder why some of us don't seem to hear the voices of the tribal people sitting in front of us today. Um, I have a few questions. My first is for Mr. Robertson. I want to read you a line from a draft document outlining the monument's review process that was released to the public. And it's, quote, due to the nature of the review and the relatively short time period involved, it is not possible to engage in formal consultation with interested tribal governments on the monument's review. I ask you, how can the DOI claim that tribes were a partner in this process or that they were even consulted when they were not engaged in the formal consultation? Thank you, Congress Moman, for the question. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, a part of uh, the original rollout of the, uh, of the study that the President had the Secretary Zinke start. And as part of that process, he came to Utah first. And one of the first things we did was to reach out to the five tribes that were identified in the proclamation um, and ask them if they would come to Salt Lake and meet with the secretary. Uh, they did, and, and uh, we had a good meeting there, uh, followed on with a tour of Utah, the, the two monuments, and him meeting with others of the Native American community and others, uh, stakeholders and residents of, of Utah as he moved through the state. Uh, the, the national process, he, he set up a, a uh, process for a public comment period um, uh, for uh, meetings, uh, listening sessions for tribes nationally and, and um, other opportunities um, that uh, included um, the uh, Deputy Secretary or um, Acting Deputy Secretary meeting uh, for the tribes in the coalition um, in uh, late May, I believe it was, and uh, to talk about and to listen to what their issues were. Um, I don't know beyond that because I was not involved in that uh, as part of my review, our support of the review, uh, what was done, but Thank I thought you. that was a good start and, and I know the Secretary listened. And uh, if uh, there's an opportunity, we'll have a second round for additional questions. Let me uh, uh, ask the gentlelady from American Samoa for her questions, comments. Talofa Lava. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva and Ranking Member Bishop for holding this hearing today. The topic of today's hearing is a bipartisan issue I've been strongly advocating for since I was first elected to Congress. On January 6, 2009, President Bush established the Rose Atoll Marine National Monument and the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument with Proclamation 8337 and Proclamation 8336. On September 29th, 2014, President Obama expanded the Primnim or Pacific Remote, Remote Islands Marine National Monument with Proclamation 9173. 
The American Samoan government and its people were barely consulted before these monuments were established or expanded. And as a result, our local fishermen were barred from accessing the waters that Samoans have been visiting for over a millennium. The monuments serve a good purpose, and I fully support that effort, but not without local input and not at the expense of access to our people who have utilized these areas for centuries, long before any relationship with the United States. Many island economies are often heavily reliant on a single industry, and in our case, it's the fishing industry. Our tuna cannery is the dominant economic force in our community. American Samoa's economy depends on access to our own EEZ. The establishment or expansion of the monuments and the restriction of all local fishing has had a major negative impact on American Samoa. We have lost two out of three of our canneries in the last decade alone. Our fishermen are the most responsible and regulated in the world. As it stands currently, these fish swim through the monuments and are then caught by nations with little to no environmental regulations. That is not helping sustainability for the future stock. Using the Antiquities Act to close U.S. waters to domestic fisheries is a clear example of federal overreach and regulatory duplication and obstructs well-managed, sustainable U.S. fishing industries in favor of their foreign counterparts, especially when the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument was arbitrarily expanded to over six times its size. It is now a half a million square miles or an area of three Californias that now is off limits to U.S. domestic fishing. Congress has already passed laws that ensures the protection and conservation of ecosystems and the species contained therein, including the Magnuson-Stevenson Act. The Department of Interior has asked the President to restore regulated fishing in the monuments because of the protections already put in place by the Magnuson-Stevens Act, protections that the Antiquities Act does not have. Limited commercial fishing can be done without harm to fish stock, sustainability, or environment because Congress has already passed and continues to update laws to ensure it. The Rose Atoll and Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monuments are just two local examples, and the establishment and alteration of our national monuments remains a bipartisan issue affecting the whole country. We need to be looking at the Antiquities Act because any president from either party should not be permitted to establish or alter a declared monument without input from the public. To that end, I am proud to co-sponsor Mr. Bishop's monument reform bill again this Congress, and I want to make it clear that I will welcome legislation from either side of the aisle that addresses this oversight. The unilateral use of an executive order when declaring sites for a national monument designation is not the right way to go about protecting our lands and waters. American Samoans and other indigenous and local groups represented here today should not have had their way of life so easily threatened by the establishment and alterations of monuments without their input. We must ensure that all parties involved have a say, and I look forward to working with the committee on addressing what I hope, what I hope remains a bipartisan issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now turn to uh, uh, Mr. Gallegos uh, for his uh, five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to all the witnesses, especially members and friends of mine on the Intertribal Council. It's good to see you guys again. Uh, and thank you for being here today. Mr. Roberson, I want a yes or no answer. Do you agree that an open, transparent, and fair process to engage local stakeholders is an important component of federal lands management decisions? Yes, sir. Great. Did the Trump administration partly rely on local stakeholder input as part of its decision to review and ultimately shrink Bears Ears National Monument by 85%? As I, re re as I uh, experienced the pro process, yes, sir. Okay. Is it also true that in 2017, the San Juan County Commission, that is the county that represents the entire Bears Ears National Monument, I've visited Bears Ears National Monument and, I've been, and been to San Juan County, voted to support Secretary Zinke's recommendation to shrink Bears Ears? 
Yes, sir. Great. In fact, proponents for illegally shrinking bears ears often relied on the fact that San Juan uh, County passed a resolution to claim that the local stakeholders were against the monument. But in 2016, many of you may not know, a federal judge ordered that the county to, it, for it to redraw its county commission lines after determining that that county uh, gerrymandered its districts in order to uh, disenfranchise the native population. As a matter of fact, in 2018, that was the first election in this newly fair drawn counties. It's also the first election to yield it a majority Navajo County Commission that fairly represents this majority Navajo County. Recently, the new fairly elected San Juan County Commission has passed a resolution supporting my bill, the Bears Ears Expansion and Respect for Sovereignty Act, which would not only preserve the original designation, but expand the monument to 1.9 million acres in accordance with the original tribal request to preserve as many sacred objects and sites as possible. Mr. Roberson, is it true that President Trump's executive order 13792 directed Secretary Zinke to specifically consider the concerns of local governments in his review of national monuments? Yes, sir. Well then, let me ask a secondary question then. Given the administration's commitment to local concerns and pursuant to that presidential executive order, will you then recommend that the administration not only reverse its decision to shrink Bears Ears, but also initiate a new review in order to expand the national mining consistent with the local opinion uh, that you, we have just seen the San Juan County's resolution? I can't answer for the department on a position on that, uh, on your legislation or on uh, San Juan Com Commission's uh, uh, passing of that of that uh, statement. So, I Mr. Robertson, you, see, me, you I, could see you could see how frustrating this would actually be for our Native American populations because they basically were stripped of their land because of local control. But you know, it, from the, the 2016 ruling, we know local control was actually a disenfranchisement by gerrymandering. So now that they've actually have fair districts, and the districts actually. Uh, the, the county actually is a fair representation of the opinion of the local county commissioners. They want to actually preserve Bears Ears and not just expand it. So, you know, what we're seeing right now is essentially the, the old saying, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, except somehow that doesn't uh, apply when uh, it comes to our Native American communities. In, in general, I think what this, I want to point out to that the American people know, we all know now, that this was one big bogus move. That there was never listening, there was never an attempt to truly listen to our Native American populations or local stake stakeholders. It was about actively ignoring local and tribal voices that supported the monument and using any local opposition as a smokescreen to justify the administration's predetermined plan to sell some of our, most nation, our nation's most precious and beautiful land, and more importantly, land that is connected spiritually, tribally, uh, to our Native countries. It's, it's a shame. Now, as chairman, of the Subcommittee for Indigenous People, I'm committed to making sure tribal voices are heard and listened to. That's why I'm including a provision to ensure that a continued role, true continued role for tribal co-management of the monument in my, is going to be in my Bears Ears uh, Protection Bill. Moving on, Lieutenant Governor, can you explain briefly why it's so important that we include tribal input in the management of national monuments like Bears Ears? Uh, thank you for that question. I believe uh, the continued use uh, and consultation, meaningful consultation early on with uh, tribes should be continued. Uh, we believe that um, through certain federal policies that the, nat uh, that the I guess the, the native voice has been reduced through different, um, I guess, policies that the federal government has, has placed upon us, including termination, the Indian, Indian Reorganization Act, and these are all policies that unfortunately that we've had to adapt to over time. Um, with the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act in 19, around 1980. Those are just clear examples of how we've been restricted in, in certain usage of our customs and practices. And this is a way that we've been trying to reformulate and have legal resources and, and I guess, sovereignty in the mind where we now pursue certain actions through regular means. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Curtis, from, sir, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member for this important hearing. A special thanks to our witnesses uh, that are here today. It's, it's great to have you all here. Well, uh, I have an interesting role in all of this. Uh, three weeks after I was elected to Congress, uh, President Trump uh, rescinded this. Uh, unlike many of you, I was not here uh, during that evaluation process. 
But I was interjected into this in a rather forceful way uh, after being in Congress just three weeks. I think it's fair to say that I wasn't prepared at that time for the magnitude uh, of this issue in my district. But since then, I, I want all here to know that uh, I've traveled to the Navajo Reservation three times. I visited the Hopi Reservation. I've been out to visit the Ute Tribe in the basin. Uh, this upcoming week, I have an appointment uh, with the Zunis that I'm looking forward to and the Ute Mountain Utes. Um, in addition, it's been my honor to uh, be the lead sponsor in the House on the Emory County Public Lands Bill, which did what everybody says can't be done, which is bring together unique uh, stakeholders, Native Americans, environmentalists, ranchers, hunters, uh, recreationalists, to find resolution on a million acres in a county that adjoins uh, Bears Ears and is right next to, to Bears Ears. And we've been able to, to do something in a pretty significant way in that county. So you can imagine my surprise and my disappointment when uh, my colleagues in the Democratic Party introduced a bill in Bears Ears. Uh, many of you here co-sponsored that bill without consulting me after all of my experience and all my work in the area to know that I wasn't even involved in, in that process. And you can understand why that feels very political to me and like it wasn't really a sincere attempt to, to solve this problem, but to score political points. I also want to know my guests to know today that I'm absolutely convinced that what Ms. Clark said in her comments uh, from the governor is absolutely true, that there is a strong, strong desire in Utah among the elected officials and the constituents to protect and preserve these very important and sacred areas, that that's never really been in question. Um, I think what has been in question is who gets to make those decisions. There are those who would advocate that those back here on the East Coast in a bureaucracy would know better, not only than the local elected officials, but the, the local tribes, that they could make those decisions for you. And I don't believe that's true. And my efforts will continue to include um, not only local input, but but management decisions from the tribes in how these lands are managed. I hope that moving forward that we can de-escalate the, the type of conversations that are so often associated with these national monuments, the divisiveness, the, the winner-take-all philosophy, and, and really sit down as we did in San Juan County with the very various interests and try to resolve these issues. As I visit this, this area, I frequently hear the comment of, well, we'll just wait till the lawsuit is settled, or we'll just wait for a new president who will change this. And I understand that, but I say to those of you who are waiting for that, that the lawsuit could take five years, it could take 10 years. It will likely then be appealed. Those of you that are lawyers know that even with the best of case, nothing is, nothing is for sure. And when I talk to lawyers on both sides of this, they're confident they will prevail, as lawyers usually are. But in my mind, that's a risky course to take. And in the meantime, we don't preserve and protect and resolve these, these difficult issues in this area. There are those who would advocate, well, a new president will come along and just extend those boundaries back. And to that, I would say, and, until another president comes and rescinds them once again. And that's a terrible way, as you can manage, manage and to, to manage this land. So I'm here to advocate today that I believe that thoughtful people can sit down together and find answers that preserve and protect this wonderful and sacred land that takes into account the many stakeholders who feel an interest in this area and for one reason or another feel very tied uh, to the history of this land. And I, I believe that we can find those answers if we can come together and I believe those answers will include preserving, protecting, honoring all people who, who, who value these lands and doing it in a permanent way. Congressional action, in my opinion, is far better than an Antiquities Act. An Antiquities Act, as was mentioned by the governor of Utah, doesn't bring additional resources and funding uh, to an area, but congressional action can. Uh, we know, uh, and Mr. Robertson, maybe you can comment on this, that currently I believe there are two BLM agents responsible for these millions of acres is that, is that an accurate statement? Yes, sir. 
what is their ability to, to effectively, excuse me, I'm out of time, but I, I would just simply point out, I don't think any of us think the two BLM agents are adequate uh, for this entire area. Thank you, I yield my time. And let me now ask, uh, turn to a uh, gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as a Coloradan with over two million acres of public land in my district, I understand the <clears throat> profound importance of protecting our nation's treasured land for historical, spiritual, and cultural purposes. And while that is certainly reason enough to protect our national monuments, there are countless economic benefits as well. In my home state alone, the outdoor industry generates $28 billion in spending and 2,290,000 uh, direct jobs. And the impacts stretch even wider. I'd be remiss to not uh, mention that as a direct result of uh, this administration's choice to rescind Bears Ears, the outdoor retailer trade show relocated uh, to Colorado after 20 years in Utah. Uh, not only is the decision to rescind these monuments morally questionable and economically unwise, but I think it is fundamentally illegal. The Antiquities Act, as has been mentioned today, does not grant the president authority to eliminate national monuments, and I believe this unprecedented rollback of federally protected lands is disheartening, uh, not just to me, but uh, to countless of my constituents who care deeply about the protection of public lands. I want to thank the tribal leaders for their work uh, in trying to secure these national monuments and, and also recognize a, a constituent of mine um, who is very active in this regard, uh, Professor Charles Wilkinson, who happened to be one of my professors at the University of Colorado School of Law, who I know worked uh, with many of the tribal leaders here today. I want to uh, ask you a question, Ms. Clark, with respect to the written testimony that you offered and, and that you read um, on behalf of uh, the governor of Utah. Uh, my understanding, I'll, I'll quote from the written testimony, uh, is the governor's words and, and yours that, quote, we should all be able to agree that 1.35 or 1.9 million acres is far larger than what the Antiquities Act envisioned. That's from the testimony that you offered today on behalf of the governor. Are you aware of Death Valley National Park, which was originally designated as a national monument? Are you aware of how many acres were originally designated as Death Valley National Monument? No, I'm not. So that's almost 2 million acres. Uh, are you aware that this monument was established via the Antiquities Act? Uh, I was aware that the Antiquities Act was underpinning it. And it was done by a Republican president, by Herbert Hoover, in 1933. Okay. Uh, are you aware of Glacier Bay National Monument in Alaska? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, uh, I would encourage you to visit. Uh, are you aware uh, of how many acres... Uh, inc were included in Glacier Bay National uh, Park when it was designated as a national monument under the Antiquities Act? I am not. All right, that number is 1.4 million acres. Are you aware of when that was designated as a national monument? No. All right, it was designated in 1925 by a Republican president, by President Calvin Coolidge. Uh, so uh, it is safe to say that uh, the bear's ears is certainly not unprecedented by its size, contrary to the testimony offered by uh, your governor. What is unprecedented uh, is the rescinding uh, of, of a monument, uh, as we've talked about. Now, I want to follow up on one item that's been discussed today by several of uh, my colleagues, and that's the, the New York Times article uh, from March 2nd of 2018. The title, Oil was Central in Decision to Shrink Bears Ears Monument, emails show. Uh, as I am sure you are no doubt aware, uh, there are a variety of emails that were published by the New York Times that expose very intentional inquiries into whether mines or processing facilities were near or adjacent to monuments, uh, and the oil and gas potential within those monuments and how protection of federal lands may have affected mining. Can you describe any consultation between your office, between representatives of the Utah state government, and the oil and gas or mining industries, specifically as it relates to discussing revoking or adjusting the Bears Ears National Monument? I am not aware of any discussions between those parties. Um, they, some may have spoken, but I'm not aware. I'm not aware of a great deal of interest on the part of the oil, gas, mining industry in that area. Are you, can you describe the consultation between the representatives of uh, Utah state government and the five tribes in support of the Bears Ears National Monument? Governor Herbert and his administration were very supportive of the public lands initiative that was chaired by Congressman Bishop and Chaffetz. And during the, the course of that effort, which spanned four or five years, uh, there was a great deal of consultation and consultation about the very area in question. And as I understand your testimony, you, I believe you said something to the effect of that there wasn't much interest 
uh, from oil and gas companies with respect okay. to Beersley's National Monument. And so I guess the question would go uh, to the director of, uh, the state director for Utah of the BLM. Um, sir, as I understand it, there was an unprecedented uh, lease sale earlier uh, last year with respect to lands that are adjacent to Bears Ears. Is, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. And that was unprecedented in terms of its, the size and scale of those leases, correct? It was, it was large compared to those we've had over the past several years. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Leader Bishop, and thanks to the witnesses for being here today. You know, as members of this committee, it should be our priority to responsibly expand our American energy supply to create new American jobs and to generate revenue for our treasuries. However, it is clear that this is yet another hearing for which some of my colleagues' only goal is to criticize the President and his administration. This hearing, like the others, has proven to be nothing more than a platform for these attacks. Truthfully, my colleagues on the other side of this aisle have neglected the fact that previous administrations have abused their executive authority in the Antiquities Act and that the Trump administration sought to fix this problem with these redrawings. Both the Clinton and Obama administrations utilized their authority to block off massive amounts of land without public review, simply to ease their activist base. These actions were done without any desire to protect legitimate antiquities, and they needed to be corrected by the Trump administration. However, my Democratic colleagues are in uh, a rate that the corrective action was taken. Mrs. Clark, uh, you have extensive involvement in Utah public land issues throughout your career. As a part of this, you have seen the Obama and Trump administrations carry out their plans regarding the Bears Ears National Monument. Because of your wealth of knowledge, I'd like to ask you about the process surrounding these administrative activities. As you know, the Obama administration claimed their actions regarding Bears Ears was born out of a locally driven concern for the protection of antiquities. Based on your knowledge of this process, would you agree with the Obama administration that there was significant, significant local consultation throughout this process? I think uh, the answer is uh, driven by what you call local. There was consultation with uh, tribal members who live within Utah and within that area. Uh, I'm not aware of significant consultation with groups that were out external to that area. So it was clear that they were done with little regard to local interests, as you just described. So even though they were characterized as having significant local consultation. Ms. Clark, for, for a good comparison, I'd like to ask you about the Trump administration's rescission of this Obama-era proclamation. Do you believe that the Trump administration utilized local input in carrying out these actions? Uh, there was a great deal of consultation with the residents and those who reside within the state and within the area designated. Thank you again, and I agree with the, everything that I've read. I agree with what you've said as well. As you noted, the Trump administration actually included significant outrage to local communities, thereby giving a voice to who had been neglected by the Obama administration. And unfortunately, uh, my colleagues do not see a problem with this, the ways in which the Obama administration uh, designated this monument. And from their statements, it is clear they do not care about the sort of transparency and have little faith in the opinions or concerns of the localities that are actually affected by these types of advancements. Instead, they would rather sit in Washington, as my colleague had mentioned, and push over protective paternalistic policies such as the Obama-era Bears Ear Monument designation. Meanwhile, the Trump administration followed all the necessary steps to rescind this overbearing and burdensome designation and was more transparent than was necessary, but the administration still gets attacked by Democrats in this committee. I highly disagree with these motives and fully support the Trump administration's thoughtful and transparent terminations to the Obama, America, Obama administration's abuse of overreach. But I would say, like my colleague to my right from Utah, I believe that we should be able to remove the politics and do what's right to preserve the historic artifacts in question. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I yield the balance of my time to my colleague to the right here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make two quick points. Uh, local tro control has been discussed uh, in this hearing, and I'd like to point out uh, that um, while the commissioners have changed in San Juan County, and we should uh, absolutely give great deference to their opinion, that when we speak of local control, we're not just talking about county commissioners. We're talking about mayors. We're talking about House representatives, Senate representatives in the state of Utah and the governor. And uh, all of those voices, uh, I believe, need to be listened to. Uh, Mrs. Clark, you're in a difficult position here representing the governor, um, but, but may I point out um, 
The issue of mining has come up, and I'd like to point out that the governor has supported me in my efforts to put a mineral withdrawal uh, in this area. This is not about mining uh, in the area, and that right. mineral withdrawal, I think, is a very important part. You, we've got just a few seconds, if you'd like to comment on that. Uh, I am aware that that is true. Uh, we would support the BLM withdrawing that, and uh, I think it's a wise use of that land and that landscape. So the governor does support your bill. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Levin. Uh, the time is yours, sir. Thank you, Chair Grijalva, for holding today's hearing. Uh, this discussion is incredibly uh, important, and I believe we will establish today that certain stakeholders were given priority during the monument, monument review and alteration process. I also believe that many changes were already predetermined, and decisions were made for the benefit of industry groups, not the American people. I'd like to explore these issues a bit further. Mr. Uh, Robertson, I found one media report last week particularly interesting. It involved energy fuels resources. Uh, this is a uranium mining and milling firm, uh, and their former lobbyist, I'm sure you've heard of him, his name is Andrew Wheeler. Uh, he was just named our EPA administrator. Uh, in his position, he's tasked with protecting the health of the American people uh, and the health of our environment. Mr. Robertson, are you aware that per these investigative reports, Certain industry interests were given the opportunity to, lo to lobby the Department of the Interior on the monuments review before the review publicly began. Sir, I, I'm totally unaware of that, that my position as state director, I was not involved in any discussions with the department pre or post. So can you explain then why the department gave secret early access to these industry stakeholders when no official review had even started? Sir, I'm just not familiar with that. I'm sorry. I suggest you read the reports. Uh, you may be interested to hear that they found that Mr. Wheeler explicitly cited his ties to the Trump campaign in gaining special access to the Department of the Interior. So much for draining the swamp. Uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Bawakati, am I correct in saying that the Bears, e Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition sent a meeting request to Secretary Zinke following his confirmation but before the National Monuments Review began? Yes. And did the department respond to your request and were you granted a meeting? We were granted a meeting with a very short notice. How would you contrast the response you received with the unfettered access given to the uranium mining company represented by Mr. Wheeler? Uh, we were given no uh, federal documents for review. Vice Chairman Small, the Bears Ears Commission created by President Obama's proclamation directed the Secretary to, and I quote, meaningfully engage the Commission, or should the Commission no longer exist, the tribal governments through some other entity composed of elected tribal government officers in the development of the management plan and to inform subsequent management of the monument, end quote. Uh, Vice Chairman Small, I'll ask again to be certain, did the former Secretary or his staff reach out to you before the start of the formal review process? No. Did the department reach out to you before the president's proclamation to eliminate 85% of Bears Ears? No. Would you agree that's a pretty glaring oversight, given, after all, how you'll be impacted? Yes, 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 I do. It's the same thing that happened with 100,000 acres of our reservation. There was no, there was no, with Mr. C um, Curtis's bill, there was no initial contact or anything made during the bill when it was being drawn up to the U Indian tribe as well. Thank you. So secret backdoor meeting with now EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler on behalf of the big corporations who stand to benefit. No comparable discussion allowed with any of you who will be directly impacted. It's unacceptable to me that this administration is happy to put the interests of industry above the interests of American regular American people time after time. And not only did the department listen to industry while shutting out tribes, but our future EPA administrator played a central role as it did so. So it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, that we're holding this hearing during, of all weeks, Sunshine Week, a week when we emphasize the importance of public information. I think it's time to continue to shine light on the Trump administration's efforts to line the pockets of its supporters to the detriment of our public lands, and I'll yield back. 
you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Roberson, I understand from your testimony that you are saying that the Antiquities Act on its face grants a lot of discretion but mandates no process on presidents. However, the Trump administration went out of its way to devise a process where previously there was none for the sake of due diligence and fairness. Is this a, uh, an accurate characterization? Yes, sir. As, as I observed it, it was an open process um, and a structured process so that the secretary could engage the broad public in, in the United States and receive information through a, a public comment period that, that we had, in my 40 years, we, we had not done for such consideration, such a national review. So I, I, w I observed it from that standpoint. Uh, as the Utah State Department. And was the input that was received broader than just, uh, I just heard a characterization of industry. Was it broader than just industry? I, again, I did not, I was not a party to the development of the report. I provided inform, information. And what we in, in uh, Utah did, what the other states did, where the 27 monuments were, was provide a, a broad suite of information about natural, cultural heritage and uh, paleo resources about the resources that relate to the objects of the monument, about the resources that exist, where we under the federal land policy management have an obligation to look at multiple use. Uh, we reached out to stakeholders um, in the state through the planning process after the proclamation. So I, I and we are continuing. I, I apologize to Congressman Gallegos for stammering when he asked the question, but, but we continue to engage the San Juan County Commission now uh, we've asked them in two, two weeks ago in a meeting that they had if they were interested in uh, being part of the commission that was envisioned by both proclamations and coming to the table with us. And we have also reached out to the tribes in that regard to see if we can get the commission established that was, uh, was a part of both, both proclamations for Bears Ears. We believe this is an opportunity for us to work with the tribes in an unprecedented way, something I haven't seen in my career to manage lands cooperatively and, and with their input. And if, as recommended by the Secretary, Congress were to give them co-management, we would be happy to, to follow okay. suit on that too. But I was not a part of any discussions with industry uh, to provide information back to So general. in your opinion, Mr. Robertson, have people from all walks of life and all stakeholders been involved in this process? It's, Definitely been a topic of discussion in Utah, uh, wide debate. There are a lot of people on all sides of the issue that brought things to the table as we move through the planning process. And I assume that that was the same nationally as the secretary was reviewing that data in July and August. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Clark, in your testimony, you mentioned why we should create protections through Congress rather than by presidential decree. When former Utah Governor Mike Levitt testified before our committee in 2017, he decried the complete lack of communication and transparency between the Clinton administration and the state of Utah prior to the proclamation of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Can you elaborate on why you believe that the open debate and transparency of the legislative process here in Congress produces better results for fan, uh, federal land management than just a simple presidential unilateral decree. Thank you. Uh, clearly, the declaration of the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument was a surprise to most Utahns, absolutely to the governor, elected officials. In fact, they had been told when rumors started and they were asked directly if there was something afoot, they were told no. They were told no two or three days before. The first time the governor was aware of what was going on was at 2 a.m. the day that the proclamation was made on the rim of the Grand Canyon. So he was lied to. Yes, he was. So when you talk about forgotten voices, uh, certainly the state and local leaders, elected officials, have felt forgotten. Uh, I do believe that when the Congress gets involved, there is always an open forum. There's opportunity for debate. Uh, everyone is aware of what is being discussed and what is going on. And ultimately, it is a reflection of the people. 
because the elected officials in Congress are elected by the people of this nation. So I think it's a much superior process. Thank you. I yield back. Let me turn to the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Huffman. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My colleague across the aisle described the Trump administration's unprecedented decision to shrink these national monuments as transparent, uh, and I will agree. But my concern is that it seems to be transparently corrupt and maybe transparently illegal. So I want to talk about that process. Mr. Roberson, uh, you have in your testimony portrayed a process by the Trump administration uh, that, that you hold forth as honest and exhaustive. You've talked about how the final decision by Secretary Zinke was informed by his travels to, uh, to the states, that there were 60 meetings, that there were multiple tribal consultations, a review of more than 2.4 million public comments, and the implication is that all of this fed into a final careful deliberative process that yielded the final decision. But the Inspector General's report portrays a, a very different process, one that began not with a careful balancing and a receiving of input, but rather with some political decisions. Uh, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the testimony job it was to draw the lines, a GIS specialist who was told to draw the lines for um, the monument, for the Grand Staircase Escalante specifically, I'm re referring to. And he was told that there was a, a numeric target, that it had to be under a million acres. He was also told that it had to exclude certain coal leases. Are you familiar with that testimony? I have not seen that testimony. So well, I'll share it with you. Uh, this again is the specialist whose job it was to redraw the boundaries at Grand Staircase Monument. He says, quote, the first area I was told to exclude from the boundary with no discussion was the coal leases from 1996. The investigator replies, when you were told to exclude that area from the monument, were there objects that were already identified within the area? Objects referring to paleontological uh, artifacts, great valuable fossils. To which the specialist replies, yes. The inspector then follows up questioning, quote, even though the removed objects were objects that the monuments created to protect, and the specialist clarifies, quote, the big one was the paleontological resources, huge dinosaur area. These coal areas are all pretty high dinosaur resources area. We were told they're out regardless. That does not sound like an honest and exhaustive process. It sounds like a pre-cooked decision to allow coal companies to mine this coal. Now, uh, further testimony from the GIS specialist sheds a bit more light on the importance of, this fossil, of these fossils. He says, quote, it's one of the areas that they found several species of dinosaurs that aren't found anywhere else in the world, end quote. Mr. Roberson, the value in that shale was not a little bit of coal, which you can find anywhere. It wasn't some incidental oil and gas. It was these dinosaur fossils that are unique on the planet. And your process told this GIS specialist, take them out, regardless, regardless of their value. Uh, I, I just want to suggest that that is fundamentally uh, antithetical to the type of open and exhaustive process that you have represented took place uh, by your agency. Now, uh, let's talk about the original Obama administration process, because publicly available emails from your staff state that the Grand Staircase Escalante's original management plan included, quote, substantial outreach, public scoping, and comment periods, end quote, and that it had, quote, many documents to demonstrate public engagement in land use planning processes, end quote. Uh, so contrary to what has been suggested, that there was no opportunity for local input, I think anybody who wanted to offer input to this process, given all of the public meetings and all of the input opportunities, must have been on a very extended sabbatical uh, and chosen, uh, perhaps, not to engage. Mr. Robertson, do you agree with BLM's assessment that the original plan, the Obama administration's plan for Grand Staircase Escalante, included significant public outreach? Uh, the, the land use plan that was completed in 2000 uh, was completed, I believe, under the Clinton administration. I was in New Mexico. You agree that it had significant public outreach? Pretty as straightforward you, as question. As you've described it. It's, Your own documents sounds, state it. 
So you're you're not disagreeing. I think, with that. I think our statement was uh, was discussed. Lieutenant Governor Bawakati, if I, if I could turn to you in my remaining time, how could you compare and contrast the outreach of the original decision versus the outreach with the Trump administration's decision? The uh, tribes uh, proposed uh, to President Obama uh, a proposal that was clearly uh, identified tribal interests, and that's how. Um, that was, that was the monument process, and I think the due diligence was done by President Obama in order to establish this monument based on tribal information and tribal voices. All right, I yield back. Thank you very much. Let me turn to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In November of 2017, Western Caucus and 24 members of the House sent President Trump a recommend recommendation letter and full analysis of 27 monuments under review. Keep in mind, in most instances, these are the 27 most outrageous monument designation by presidents. In the Western Caucus letter, we recommended shrinking or rescinding 24 of the 27 monuments under review. The Western Caucus analysis found three monuments that had local support, were not political, and met the definition of the smallest area compatible with the proper care of the objects to be protected. Now, Mr. Chairman, I ask that the Western Caucus uh, November 2017 letter providing thoughtful comments and recommendations for the President Trump's monument review be submitted for the hearing record. Thank you. Now, here are some notable quotes and facts from the Western Caucus uh, uh, letter. The Ironwood Forest land grab in Arizona cost our economy hundreds of millions of dollars, killed good paying jobs, attacked ranchers, and prevented multiple use of lands within the monument. The Ironwood Forest land grab enacted a complete ban on recreational shooting and encircled the entire Silver Bell mine in operations, as well as other claims that encompass massive mineral deposits that contain critical minerals. If this unconstitutional taking was not political in nature, it would have significantly different boundaries and would be hundreds of thousands of acres smaller. Lincoln County Commissioner Ch Chair Kevin Phillips on the Basin and Range Monument in Nevada. Disgusting, loathsome, illegal, and unfair in recounting the county's year-long fight, years-long fight to prevent a monument. Lake Berryessa, uh, Chamber of Congress President Ch Craig Morton on the Berryessa Snow Mountain Monument in California. It is a geographically and ecologically incoherent patchwork for federal parcels. Lake Berryessa is not even geographically connected on the map to the rest of the proposed National Monument, which stretches far into Northern California. The eastern boundary of the map is coincident with the borders of Glen and Calisso uh, counties. The reason is political, not ecological. Douglas County Commissioner Tim Freeman and Cascade Siskiyou Monument in Oregon. Douglas County stands to lose the most because it is a national monument, managed much like a national park. The forest there on those lands would be locked up and unavailable for timber harvest. A rough estimate is that those lands could have brought $2.5 million a year into the county's general fund. That's more than the annual cost of the library system, which is about to shut down for lack of funds. Former Democratic Carbon, uh, Carbon County Commissioner John Jones and the Grand, and the Grand uh, Staircase Escalante Monument in Utah. President Clinton deprived the people of Utah and the nation of its cleanest, low sulfur, high BTU coal supply across the plateau. As a result, Utah taxpayers saw more than $2 billion in mineral lease royalties and 60% of their known coal reserves disappear before their eyes. Like Bears Ears, the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument also included a significant amount of educational land resulting in a huge socioeconomical loss to the state of Utah and could have been $25 billion or more. San Juan County Commissioner Rebecca Benally, a Diné and Navajo woman on Bears Ears in Utah. Bears Ears National Monument campaign is a cynical political stunt that will deny grassroots Navajos access to their sacred spiritual grounds. Traditional Utah Navajo people are now magazine environmentalists but are real stewards of the land, whose interests will be destroyed by a Bears Ears National Monument. Now, with my limited time, Ms. Clark, was the state of Utah consulted prior to the President Obama's designation of the Bears Ears Monument and locking up 1.35 million acres of borders within? The, not per se, not about the monument at all. Yeah, I, it would have been nice to have the president show up here to tell us exactly why they came up with, and it's, and it's bipartisan. I mean, it's, it, it's Republican as well as Democrat right. to find out the consultation process that they, they used. 
You talk about the locally driven solutions contained in the lands package signed by President Trump yesterday. How does that contrast in comparison to the previous two presidents designating massive 1.35 million and 1.9 million mon uh, acre monuments with a stroke of the pen in Utah? I think the um, operation of developing the lands bill was bipartisan. It was not all political. We pulled people together, we listened and talked, and I think we've got a great result that both Democrats and Republicans can stand behind. Yeah, These, I, um, I, I live in the time. I, I want to point out every, to everybody this, this uh, document. It's very accurate. If you see the dark red, the burnt orange, it shows the Obama took in 553,000, uh, 1,572,396 acres. The whole rest of the presidents took in 286,000. This is not about ecological preservation. This is about political stunts and, and captivating that acreage. I yield back. Uh, let me turn to the gentleman from California, Mr. Van New Jersey. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, I don't know if I insulted you or not. <laughs> Mr. Van Drew, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, due to her passion and her depth of knowledge, I would yield my time to the gentle lady to my right, Ms. Halland. Thank you, Mr. Van Drew. Um, Vice Chair Small, Lieutenant Governor Boakati, and Vice Chair Tanakongva, uh, if you could just answer this yes or no. Do your people still practice your religion on Bears Ears? Yes. 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 Thank you. And um, this, go, this question goes to Vice Chair Tanakongva, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Ranking member Bishop referenced the idea that the cute name of Bears Ears is a reason why people care about it. What do you say about that? And, and what is your reason for caring about Bears Ears? As I described earlier, there is the perfect Kiva, which we still practice on Hopi, the same spiritual cultural connection that we have at home and to Bears Ears is very important to us. We didn't just leave evidence there. We left it there for a purpose. And I believe that in order for the country to recognize and to look at us as far as native people is that we do have a right. We, do, we, we practice our religion there and we left it there and we still practice it at home. So that, that is why it's very important to the Hopi, Hopi people and other nations that have ties to Bears Ears. Thank you very much. Lieutenant Governor Bo Boacati, the Pueblo of Zuni is in New Mexico. Why do you feel that you should have a say in a national monument in what is now Utah? Zuni's uh, ancestral footprint is bigger than Zuni. Uh, I will refer to an area in Arizona, we refer to as our Zuni heavens. We make a pilgrimage there every four years. And because of uh, different land allocation process and um, boundary lines, um, we've been almost prevented from doing that in certain times, whether through easement agreements or through private land, home, uh, land ownership. We are prevented from being able to access uh, Zuni Heavens historically, but now we have restored our access to that. And that is one example of why uh, access to sacred sites is so important to us, because we did not leave these areas um, just for the purpose of not returning to them. These are homes that we will continue to live in, and uh, our spirit, uh, spirits of our ancestors still reside there. Would anyone else like to answer that question? Mr. I'm sorry, Vice Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for the question. Is that in Hopi, we never just leave an area. It's always remembered. Why is it that we have place names? Why is it that we make pilgrimages? Yes, maybe there's nobody there today, but we know spiritually they're still there, especially the remains. And I hope everybody recognizes it that if one day you all listen to the voices of Native America, I think we would unite a lot better than what, it, what the country is going in today. 
It would hurt all the nations that have ties to Bears Ears if oil, mining, and other activities that were to occur there. How would you feel if I took an ATV and rode around in your church area? Is that something that's desecrating the area too? This is the same thing that's happening there because the whole area of that area in Bear, what they call Bears Ears now is sacred to all the nations that are here today. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this question, I have a little bit of time left, but I'll pose this question, and if, um, uh, if you all could answer it, that would be great. Um, in her, in, during the questioning, Ms. Clark stated that she feels that Congress should decide these matters because they are elected and represent the people. Do all of you feel represented by your members of Congress and that they're carrying your voice here? Thank you for that. I would say no because we are the elected leaders of our tribes. Our responsibilities do not end at the reservation line. We have our responsibilities that affect um, uh, our interests uh, that um, affect our tribal members, and that includes um, public lands and, and the 106 consultation process. Uh, gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Um, thank you. First of all, Ms. Holland, I want to congratulate you and Mr. Curtis. You have sat here the entire time. That's cool. It is probably a good thing that we have never had a quorum present or we would never get to the second panel. But I appreciate what you have done. I also appreciate Amanda Radwagon's comments up here as she was talking about another forgotten voice that took place in the islands when monuments were made unilaterally by a particular president. That is something that is very good. Um, look, I have so many things I need to just point out here that were brought in here. And it's sad that sometimes allegations are made and then people leave here because we need to go back through what those allegations are. So let me do this pretty quickly. Mr. Robeson, you were asked and given a comment that there were a whole lot of emails that showed that there was a great deal of input in the land use plan for Grand Staircase. What that was talking about was the land use plan that you came up with, correct? Yes, sir. Which That's is quite different, Ms. Clark extremely different from the creation of the monument when, when there was no input. So they were comparing apples and oranges and that kind of exchange that was good there. Ms. Robeson, let me come back there because one of the members said that the goal of your administration was to sell, and that's the verb they use, sell these lands. Has that selling of these lands ever been talked about or contemplated? No, sir. The, uh, uh, the secretary made it clear. All right, you said that. No. That simply was a wrong verb. It should not have been used in that particular. In fact, the concept that was actually made by that, by the gentleman, was that if there's a change in the political organization, maybe you should go back and relook at everything, which would apply not just to, not just to this particular monument, but probably apply to every particular monument, which is one of the things we're talking about. There is no plan or process in which that can actually be accomplished. Ms. Clark, the Aneth chapter, which abuts this area, they, wrote, they had a formal resolution to oppose it. Has that ever been rescinded? No, sir. Okay, even though they tried it again. There was also the accusation that this was done simply because of oil and gas. Mr. Curtis, come to you. Is there any oil and gas in that area? No, as a matter of fact, Energy Fuels endorsed my mineral withdrawal for 1.35 million acres. So will you put this map in the record which shows Bears Ears and shows that there are no oil and gas claims there? Yes, and that, please. And the reason you took away mining extraction from uranium was because what? There's no uranium, Mr. Okay. Chairman. This was not the first. That kind of statement is simply, is simply demagoguery of the highest. Now, it is amazing to me that we always talk in this chamber about our fealty to NEPA. NEPA is the process to guarantee public input. And we always want NEPA unless it comes to the Antiquities Act and a president declaring and creating a national monument. We even had a bill several years ago to insist that any monument had to go through the NEPA process. And the White House was apoplectic, saying a president doesn't have the time to go through the NEPA process, even though everybody else in this world is, which is the irony of the situation, which is why you are wise to have this hearing. It's a good hearing, but it's narrow in its focus. 
We need to create legislatively a process and a program with rules for creation as well as for, po for potential re reductions. Ms. Clark, you were the BLM director for a long time. There have been 16 national monuments that have been adjusted, right? Yes. That's good enough. Let me go back here. Mr. Robeson, when you were talking about the Sha Cha panel, the advisory panel that you came up with, it is advisory only, correct? Well, the, the commission would advisory. Has established the, under the bill that the congressman proposed, it's advisory. Under the Not his bill. What you can do is advisory. Ms. Clark, you're BLM director. The proclamation Obama used, the commission they established, is it only advisory? No. The only way you can give actual authority is by legislative action, which is what the Curtis bill attempted to do, what we did with Golden Spike. If you want something in which, look, this is what we are talking about. I really would like to have those people who live in those areas and the Native Americans who, who expect that as sacred land, they should have a real say, not an advisory say, but give them the authority to tell the land managers how it will be done. We'll hear later on on whether, on whether it is able to go into those areas with motorized vehicles to, get, to collect firewood. That can, that can be taken away simply by the pen of any land manager, and that should not be the way. That's what we're talking about in trying to come up with real ways of, of doing this type of indigenous. Oh, good grief. I got 17 seconds. Quickly, give me in your indigenous tongue how you would say bear's ears, because I didn't say bear's ears was cute. That's what the environmentalist community in San Francisco said it was. In, in Hopi, how would you say bear's ears? Onmuru. Thank you. Zuni. Onmuru. Thank you. And you? We are got Nakaba. Thank you. And in Navajo, Shasha. Fine. I apologize. I have a whole lot more I needed to go through, but there's no way I'm going to get to it. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Uh, Mr. Robertson, thank you for being here. Uh, you testified uh, to the Inspector General as part of the report on the monuments review. Uh, in your testimony to the IG, you state, no one ever asked me how I would draw the boundaries. You also, uh, and you compared the review uh, process to the Wizard of Oz. And even uh, career employees on the ground couldn't see behind the curtain, and, yet, and you specifically note, we would provide them information, like they were asking about Butler Wash, how important is Butler Wash, and we would tell them Butler Wash and Cedar Mesa are critically important archeologically. So let me follow up, Mr. Robertson. If Cedar Mesa is so important archaeologically, did it receive protection in the altered monument designation? It did not. It is protected as under WSAs and under um, a, a historic district for uh, part of it. So we do have some ongoing protection under the 2008 plan, but not in the proclamation, sir. Yeah, and if you had been given the opportunity to uh, draw the boundaries, uh, do you believe that the new monuments are protective of the critically important sites at Bears Ears and also uh, Grand Staircase Escalante? What, what we did was provide all the information that we had on paleo, cultural heritage resources, uh, to the department, and uh, we were not asked back how would we draw lines, but we provided. As a, all as that a professional career, uh, professional, how do you do you feel, as an opinion, as in your learned opinion, do you feel that the new designations protect those? Well, as the, as a career employee, I, I don't take a policy decision on these. I follow the policy of the president and and the administration. And fair I, enough. Um, so. Fair enough. Uh, let me, uh, let me for uh, the three uh, elected representatives of, of uh, the tribes that are here with us. Uh, the Department of Interior's policy on consultation with Indian tribe states, when considering a department action, action with tribal implications, a bureau or office must notify appropriate Indian tribes of the opportunity to consult pursuant to this policy. Adequate notice entails providing description of the topics to be discussed, a timetable of the process, and possible outcomes. The notice should, should also give tribal leaders the opportunity to provide feedback prior to 
a consultation, including any request for technical assistance, information, or clarification on how that consultation process conforms to this policy. So to the three of you, uh, did, uh, do you believe what occurred in terms of the subject today, the two monuments, did you believe it, the act <coughs> uh, conforms with the Department of Interior policy on consultation with your regard to them seeking input information from your respective tribes? Uh, no, the coalition tries to not feel that maybe a consultation would occur. It's open to. Any other comments? No. Thank you. I, I, uh, I just want to point out something, back to, in, 90, in 1998, as part of an agreement with the Department of Interior uh, concerning the Grand Staircase Escalante uh, designation, Utah received uh, $50 million from the federal government and agreed to a sweeping land, land exchange in which it, uh, the state received thousands of acres of mineral-rich federal lands uh, to date, the state and local and state institutions have received about $350 million of benefits from the, those former federal assets. Uh, Utah then agreed to drop the, its legal challenges to the monument. The agreement was later ratified by Congress. And, uh, and, and now, uh, with the revocations of the very monument protections agreed to in 1998, uh, let me ask you as a representative of the state, Ms. Clark, uh, should the state have to repay the $50 million to the federal government so far as now? Uh, it's been shrunk in half, and, and uh, portions of it have been revoked. I, I do not believe so, because the lands in, within the former monument are now under control of the agency, so we wouldn't get those back. But... Uh, well, with that, let me... Uh, you back and uh, uh, anybody else here? Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the members of the panel oh, that's why you're, for being here. Uh, you're done with your five minutes. In one ha when I've had multiple committee hearings this morning, so, I'm, so I miss some of these uh, issues that have been raised, but I'd like to talk to Mr. Roberson about the ongoing management planning process uh, and I think you've been involved in this, the ongoing management process. First question is, uh, do you think accessibility of fossil fuel resources is a priority in these yet to be released monument manage, management plans? In our resource management plans, monument management plans, we, we look at decisions for the broad spectrum of resources within that area that we are analyzing. Within the, the uh, five units of the National Monuments, that is not a consideration. Within the areas that uh, are covered by the lands excluded from Grand Staircase, we are looking at those, although a quarter of the lands that were uh, removed um, are under Wilderness Study Area uh, designation and would, would require uh, congressional decision. So, so some of the area that was removed is under wilderness study area. Some of it is being looked at for, uh, uh, in terms of uh, fo maybe potential fossil fuel resource within the management, within the area itself, there is not. But since this is a reduction, we will be looking at what's just outside or outside in terms of fossil fuel. Uh, Next question, is there a focus on ensuring that there, when we're talking about inside and outside, really, of the, is there a focus on ensuring protections for tribal resources that are now cut out of the original boundaries? Yes, sir. The, all the, the uh, laws that protect archaeological, cultural heritage, paleontological resources still are in effect. The National Environmental Policy Act, the Federal Land Policy Management Act, um, and in, in Bears Ears, about a third of the land that, that came out of protected status uh, authored by the first proclamation, about a third of that is wilderness study area. We have quite a bit of that land that also is uh, a historic district, special management recreation areas, et cetera. So we, 
we have a broad spectrum of, we analyzed in 2008 the potential uh, of those lands for those resources. And I think as was just mentioned, uh, largely any development potential was outside uh, the boundaries of those. But we, are, we did still make some decisions in the 2008 plan for okay. Bears Ears. What, what about how much, in understanding this, how much taxpayer money uh, has been spent on updating these plans? We, we um, as part of the guidance that we uh, were given on uh, streamlining our and, and uh, making more efficient our planning and, and NEPA process, we have an obligation to put on the front of those documents the cost of those documents. And I, I believe for the draft plan, um, it was about, uh, for both plan, all five plans, mm -hmm. um, it was about um, $1.2 million. And $1.2 million. Dollars. When, the new, when the new plans come out, and that's generally, and I was a planner before state director and I uh, worked back here, the, these plans take uh, often as many as, as five or six years. We had hoped that uh, some, some take longer, some shorter. Um, these plans we're trying to get out in a year, year and a half. Um, so so we're what you're saying is... We're trying to the page numbers and, and make them more efficient and readable for the public. So this plan, these plans will come out, you're estimating, in a year to a year and a half? These that. will come out um, this year. Th this we, year? We will have spent a year and a half total. Okay. And there will be a price on each document of what the cost of the development of that plan was. And so I can, I can give you that. I'd like to see separately. that, thank you. Yes, sir. And so, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, let me thank all of you for your valuable, valuable uh, testimony and information. I'm now gonna invite panel two to take their places at the witness table, and uh, the rules of engagement being the same, uh, limited to five minutes per each person on the second panel. Entire statement, it will be part of the hearing record. And uh, when the light turns yellow, you have a minute. And when it turns red, time is up. And I ask uh, Vice Chair to please uh, chair the meeting until, 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 until. I shall return in about 10 minutes. There we go. I just tripped on the seat. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah. Um, Mr. Bishop? Before he left. It's noon already. Hmm? It's noon already. No, yeah. I would recommend he let them talk and ask no questions. I think that we would have a tough time. I mean, Hello. We'd like to start the hearing now. Oh, sorry, we're waiting on one more witness. It looks like. Waiting on one witness. I guess we can. Who's the first one, Ms. Crow? The first, each witness will have five minutes, and we'll hear from Ms. Croft first. Chairman Grijalva, Ranking Member Bishop, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony in the record and share my concerns with the way the Trump administration's review of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument was conducted. 
I'm a sixth generation Utahn, and my family moved from Salt Lake City to Escalante in 2007, excited to live and work at the doorstep of the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Escalante is a town of roughly 800 people and is one of the most rural communities in the lower 48. My husband and I brought our two young children and our general contracting business with us. I'm the executive director for Grand Staircase Escalante Partners, the only nonprofit organization serving the communities of the Grand Staircase Escalante. Founded in 2004 by local citizens eager to support the new monument, our mission is to preserve and protect the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. We actualize this mission through on-the-ground projects in partnership with the Bureau of Land Management and our com communities, as well as through education and advocacy. We train archaeological stewards to monitor sensitive cultural sites and to support the monument's paleontology program. Our education program, Frontier Science School, provides opportunities for all ages to, to share in the exciting discoveries of the monument, teach good land stewardship, and experience the monument firsthand. Our largest program is the restoration of the Escalante River, the largest riparian restoration effort on BLM lands in history. This project is in its 10th year and has been conducted with the support of over 700 Youth Corps members and in collaboration with federal and state government agencies, private landowners, businesses, and other nonprofit organizations. To date, we have raised over $10 million for this effort alone. In 2018, local volunteers accrued over 9,000 hours in service of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument through our various programs. Secretary Zinke and President Trump, along with politicians from Utah, claimed that getting the Grand Staircase Escalante was necessary in order to give local people more control. Yet in two, May of 2017, Secretary Zinke suspended the very committee designed to do just that. He suspended the Monument Advisory Committee, which was comprised of locals, stakeholders, and BLM leadership, and stopped the committee from discussing issues, addressing management concerns or new approaches, along with BLM management updates. This was exactly the venue for local stakeholder involvement. It's yet to be reconvened. In light of President Trump's proclamation that reduced Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument by nearly half, People in our communities are concerned about the negative impacts to the health of the landscape, the loss of scientific research, and the decline of the quality of, of life that living in close proximity to public lands that are subject to such radical change. How would, changes, how would these changes impact our businesses and our lives over the long term? Would people like I had done over 10 years earlier bring their families and businesses to our communities? In the midst of the monument review, Grand Staircase Escalante partners recognized that we needed to watch for expedited industrial development or illegal activity on the monument. And to do so, we developed a citizen monitoring app for use on mobile phones. Since its launch, we've received over 145 reports of vandalism, the most egregious being a fire set inside a Native American archaeological site, dumping of trash, and rampant illegal off-road vehicle use. The monument review signaled to some people that the critical protections given to the Grand Staircase Escalante in the 1996 proclamation and refined over the last 20 years had been removed. However, the American people continue to voice outrage at even the consideration of the largest rollback of public lands protections ever proposed. 2.8 million people submitted comments during the monument review, 99% of them in favor of keeping or expanding our national monuments. In my own great state of Utah, these comments were nearly nine to one in favor of keeping Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante, Escalante National Monument intact. Why was overwhelming public support to protect our national monuments simply ignored? 600 businesses and chambers of commerce across the nation joined with the Escalante Boulder Chamber of Commerce in a letter of support. Nearly 1,000 veterans, 200 faith leaders, and 200 scientists, research, and academic organizations have signed letters of support for Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, noting the value of this majestic place and the importance of protecting it for future generations. I thank the committee on behalf of members and supporters of Grand Staircase Escalante partners and our communities for providing this opportunity for our voices to be heard and to examine how and why these decisions were made to plunder America's most special natural, scientific, and cultural places. Thank you very much, Ms. Croft. Uh, we will next hear from Ms. Dana Wagoner. You have five minutes. And just so you know, the light turns yellow if you didn't know when you have a minute left. Uh, my name is Dana Wagoner, and I live in Escalante, Utah. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. 
My intrigue with the Grand Staircase Escalante began in the early 90s when I was proving my daughter's senior paper on the establishment of the monument. Little did I dream that our family would be moving to Escalante, Utah and purchasing our business, Escalante Outfitters, in 2008. In 2008, we were open eight months out of the year with eight employees. Today, we have expanded the season uh, to 10 months with 28 employees. Escalante Outfitters is a tourism-based business with cabins, campgrounds, gear store, cafe, and guide services. We have financially doubled in sales since 2008. But more importantly, we have provided jobs for our community, and we've become active citizens in our small town. As a member of the Garfield County Travel Council, I am proud of what our county has accomplished in promoting uh, tourism throughout southern Utah. Our national parks are magnificent, but the monument is special. The monument provides an opportunity for solitude and reflection, exploration, and a moment of disconnect from our hectic lives. Every child should experience the quietness of the desert, the flow of the stream leading to a beautiful waterfall, or lying under the glory of the unobstructed Milky Way. Over and over again, we hear the stories of our travelers who are so thankful for this uniquely American experience. People are truly yearning for this type of experience that only the wilderness can provide. Early on, we learned that there were many misconceptions of a national monument. But as the years passed, these misconceptions began to subside, and we began seeing long-term residents building resorts, opening restaurants, building a, and opening a hardware store. We have a rural, new rural clinic. We have a small manufacturing plant, and plans have been begun to, began to be made for a science institute where our local dinosaurs are curated and natural history can be preserved. Unlike many rural towns, we are not dying. We are changing and we are thriving. In December of 2016, the Chamber of Commerce Board agreed not to support the reduction of the resolution to reduce the monument. No members declined their support on this position. We began collecting letters from our businesses and concerned citizens to request in a voice in any of the forthcoming decisions. In March of 2017, we traveled to Washington, D.C. with 120 letters in hand to give to the newly appointed Secretary Ryan Zinke. We met with representatives that assured us that all correspondence would be answered. Two years later, we have yet to receive a response. We went back home and we tried every avenue we could to be heard, but Secretary Zinke came and went without meeting with the chamber or any pro-monument businesses. We were really disheartened when Secretary Zinke toured the monument, but would not meet with local business owners. We traveled to Kanab, hoping for an audience, and once again, we were denied. In the one public meeting uh, that the Garfield County Commissioners held about reducing the monument, there was not enough room to seat all the citizens, and we were asked to sit on one side of the room if we supported the monument, and on the other side of the room if we opposed the monument. Friends and neighbors divided. When the president issued the proclamation to reduce the monument nearly in half, we were still waiting to be recognized. We are concerned about our livelihood. Our guests are asking questions about the future of the monument, and we have no concrete answers. Last season, many people remarked we decided to visit the monument before it's broken up. This year, we've had a slow start to our season and our family is concerned about our future. It is difficult to make plans for the future with this much uncertainty. Our family has put everything we have into Escalante. The monument is our livelihood. As the practical woman I ask you, is injecting this much economic uncertainty for the future and the legal cost of this battle worth it? Can we sit together not on opposite sides of the room, but face to face and come up with better solutions. I'm back in Washington today, hoping that this committee will begin truly listening to the American people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wagner. We will move to Dr. David, I'm sorry, P. David Pauley. Dr. Pauley, five minutes. Chairman Holland, Ranking Mich Member Bishop, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the impacts of the proposed reduction 
of these two monuments on the science of paleontology. I'm a, professor, I'm a professor at Indiana University and the immediate past president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. The Society is the largest professional organization of paleontologists in the world with a mission to dis encourage the discovery, conservation, and protection of vertebrate fossils and fossil sites. We have a fruitful history of collaboration with the state of Utah, the U.S. Department of the Interior, the U.S. Forest Service, and U.S. Congress on fossil protection on public lands. About 10% of our members have worked on the monuments. Grand Staircase has made a profound impact on science. In the late 1980s, Rich Cefeli and Jeff Eaton discovered fossil mammals from an interval of the Cretaceous period that had never produced mammals before. By 1996, important fossils had been identified in 20 out of the 24 geological units that were to be incorporated into the monument. Since the monument was established, more than 3,500 fossil localities have been documented. This work has taught us how the Earth recovered from its largest extinction, about the effects of oxygen depletion on Cretaceous oceans, and especially about how the Earth's ecosystems became modern in a process known as the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution. Just in terms of dinosaurs, 13 new species have been discovered, like Diabloceratops, the devilish-looking horned dinosaur sitting here in front of me, um, or Lythranax, the so-called king of gore. New fossil mammals, birds, lizards, plesiosaurs, plants, and insects have also been found there, and statistical analysis indicates that we're still in the initial discovery phase with many more yet to come. The fossils of Grand Staircase have not just benefited scientists, they've engaged the nation. Literally thousands of videos can be found on YouTube of Lythranax alone, ranging from science shorts to computerized reconstructions of the King of Gore battling its cousin Tyrannosaurus rex. One Grand Staircase researcher, Dr. Scott Sampson, is known to nearly everyone under the age of 20 as the paleontologist from Dinosaur Train. And even former Secretary Ryan Zinke chose a Grand Staircase dinosaur to exhibit in his office. National monuments don't just protect fossils, they conserve them. Protection is important, of course, but basic protection is now provided on all public lands by the Paleontological Resources Preservation Act, or PRPA. Monuments do more. They actively enhance the value of their scientific resources to make the most of them for the American people. For example, doc, um, monument paleontologist Dr. Alan Titus conducts surveys of new fossil resources and assesses their vulnerability. He establishes research priorities for the funding that comes from the National Conservation Land System and from BLM. He deploys that funding so that the best specialists from around the world can study the fossils, trackways, and sediments of the monument. And he ensures that the fossils are placed in the public trust, available both to the scientific community and to the nation. Without the added value of monument status, we would not know about the Cretaceous Revolution, and there would have been no King of Gore for Secretary Zinke to share his office with. In December 2017, Trump cut more than 1,100 sites from Grand Staircase, which you see on the map uh, displayed on the screen, which is about 31% of those currently known, along with those still undiscovered in the large swaths that are yet to be surveyed. He removed many of the resources named in the original proclamation, like Circle Cliffs, Tropic Shale, and the older half of the famous Kaparowitz sequence. Even the rare mammal sites that led to the establishment of Grand Staircase he cut. Mr. Trump's proclamation claimed that, quote unquote, two decades of intense study have refined our understanding of where paleontological resources are found. Those studies have, in fact, shown that the excluded areas are rife with scientifically important sites. His new boundaries cannot, therefore, logically represent the, quote unquote, smallest area compatible with their proper care. Mr. Trump's proclamation also made the astounding claim that PRPA would provide the equivalent care for those excise sites. PRPA simply makes collecting vertebrate fossils without a scientific permit illegal. It doesn't proactively conserve them, nor does it prioritize them over other multiple use activities like mineral extraction. Furthermore, PRPA's effectiveness is currently limited because Interior has yet to publish regulations. The immediate impacts on science are confusion over permits and uncertainty about upcoming field seasons. The long-term impacts are the loss of priority for paleontological resources, which may result in the loss of the sites themselves, as well as the loss of research funding and proactive enhancement of their value. Much of the scientific potential of the excluded areas will remain unrealized if these cuts are implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pauly. We will go to the Honorable Leland Pollack. Mr. Pollock. Good morning. My name's Leland Pollock. I'm the Garfield County Commission Chairman. I've been elected by the people to work for the people. I'm the only one here today speaking for those 
people. And actually, I'm speaking for the, Gar the Kane County Commission as well, because they agree with the Garfield County Commission. We support the reduction of this monument. Now, why? You talk about forgotten voices? Let me tell you something. When Bill Clinton created that monument in 1996, he didn't even, he didn't even have enough respect to get a hold of our governor, let alone our, our local elected officials. My second point is, over that span of 20 years, we were forgotten. Now, it's been stated over and over in, two, in both hearings how no input, uh, people are tired of, of not getting any input, and on and on and on. But as long as the Antiquities Act is there, presidents are going to use it. Now, the point I'm going to make about dinosaur bones is very important, okay? We have nothing against them. It's like tourism. We have nothing against tourism, okay? But dinosaur bones are still protected. They're still protected. BLM is heavily regulated. That office that manages the Grand Staircase is in the same building with the BLM field office. They're in the same building. The director, the state director of the BLM, just testified, we manage both. He manages both. So clearly, this is really not about um, lines or boundaries or maps. This is redefining the management. So let's talk about the management. Restoration, it's been mentioned over and over and over. Within the old boundaries that Bill Clinton created, we could not do restoration projects, none. We had soil erosion, we had all kinds of noxious weeds and all kinds of problems that went on for 20 years. Right outside the boundaries of that monument that the BLM managed, they could do restoration projects. That's right, restoration projects and recovery projects for the habitat, not just for grazing, but for the land and for wildlife. Currently, the state of Utah has a watershed restoration initiative program. We work hand in hand with the state of Utah and the BLM to implement that program. It is a recovery program. One more point I'm going to make here that's very important, and if I have time, I could, I could go on and on and on. I'm a lifetime resident of that county. I grew up in that monument boundary that's now still a monument. But the children of Escalante, let me tell you something, in 1996, that little school had 150 children, 7th through 12th grade. In 1996, in 2016, we declared a state of emergency because the school district come to us. It was not three commissioners that were far right or radical. It was the school district that come to us and says, we've got a real problem. How do you educate? I think they were down to 51 children that they estimated. How do you educate 51 children 7th through 12th grade? Think about that. Now, why did it go from 150 all the way down to, to 51? I think those are the numbers, give or take, because of the local economy. If you can't put food on the table for your family, you're not going to be able to raise kids and put them through school. So you can imagine what that does and what a drain that is. So currently, 87% of the property tax we collect as a county property tax goes to the school district. We survive on 13% of that property tax revenue. One more point, tourism is up. We are ex experiencing record numbers all over Garfield County. Uh, all three, I believe, uh, that I have data on, the visitor centers within the monument, that visitation went up after the reduction. The land's still there. People are still coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pollock. Uh, next, we'll hear from Ms. Suzette Morris.
Thank you, Member Holland, um, Ranking Republican Bishop, and members of the Natural Resource <coughs> Committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing regarding the for forgotten voices in the National Monument debate. My name is Suzette Morris, and I'm a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe from White Mesa, Utah. When I think of forgotten voices in the debate over national monuments, particularly Bears Ears, I think of my family, my ancestors, and my tribe's heritage. We've heard a lot today about antiquities and artifacts in need of protection. My family and I are living tributes to the antiquities of the Bears Ears era. I am that unique Native American basket that you have held in your hands or seen once in a lifetime. You, so you have touched a link in a chain of history that bounds me to a generation for 7,000 years. I am as sacred as the land my great-great-great-grandfather, Old Posey, fought for in 1924. Old Posey, leader of his people, was given allotted lands to about 30 members of his family by Congress. These allotted lands are located a few miles east of the Bears Ears National Monument in an area called Allen Canyon. This land has been ours for generations. There is no one who cares for the land more than we do. From a young age, I was taught to respect and value our lands from our elders. In our community, public lands are our most valuable resource. We use the land for hunting, wood cutting, gathering sage and medicinal herbs, and for sacred ceremonies. Expansion of the monument to its original size would once again limit our access to these allotted lands. The descendants would no longer have the freedom to utilize our lands whenever we want. The beautiful, pristine, peaceful land full of harmony would no longer be. There may be lots of rules and customs, but having respect for, for one of them will help you to understand character and vitality of the people of White Mesa and San Juan County. I quote <coughs> Chief Seattle, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things are connected. There was once a time in our Indian history that was never known to the world where the Plains women were powerful warriors who rode along the side of their warriors. I may not come here in such a way as long ago, but I am here to ask in a humble way to let my people keep <coughs> our traditional ways, which is the key to the open land that my people walked for their native needs. When the Bears Ears National Monument was originally made by President Obama, it was, very, it was a very upsetting day. Our voices had not only been forgotten, they had been silenced by special interest groups funded by Hollywood actors and by tribes who don't live anywhere near Bears Ears. The leaders of my own tribe did not consult with our White Mesa community. We live closest to the area before choosing to support the National Mon Monument designation. They chose to ignore our voices and supported the Obama Monument in secret rather than hearing our point of view. They did not ask, to, ask us to support the monument because the majority of us do not. In a refreshing contrast, President Trump and Secretary Zinke listened to the concerns of the Native people and the local residents of San Juan County. Secretary Zinke toured Bears Ears and met with the local people whose voices were ignored by the previous decision. Following this review process, President Trump reduced the National Monument to a much more reasonable size. I am hopeful that this right sizing of the monument represents a clear slate for these lands as well as their renewed commitment to local input. It is an honor to be here today. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to, to your questions. Thank you very much. And uh, let me now uh, turn to uh, the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Hartford, for his comments or questions. Thank you very much, uh, 
Chairman Grijalva for organizing today's hearing on our national monuments. And I would like to begin uh, first by thanking uh, my colleague, Representative Holland, for her remarks at the beginning of the briefing and about the ancestral significance of American lands and the importance of respecting and consulting indigenous people before Congress, the president, or any other body of government makes decisions about the use of American land. Today's hearing marks a new day for the House Natural Resources Committee. For too long, the voices of indigenous people have been silenced and left out of discussions about the management of our shared lands. No longer should we tolerate ignorance to the concerns of those people who know our land best, the people who have been faithful stewards of America's land for millennia. Before we become too focused on any one bill or policy, we should start by developing a dialogue between the committee, our native peoples. We must listen to our colleagues, like Representative Holland and others, who bring unique perspectives to this committee, this Congress, and our nation as a whole. We have an obligation as a committee to have a serious debate about the historical qualities of our land and water and how decisions regarding the use of our environment impact our people, all of our people. My district, which is home to three national monuments in Nevada, offers unparalleled opportunities for recreation, historical preservation, and conservation. The Tule Springs National Monument, for which I worked with local stakeholders and the ranking member when he was chair, to establish and protect. Um, it protects our region's ancient history, including fossils of the Colombian mammoth and other extinct species of the Ice Age. When working to protect Tule Springs, we worked to ensure that the monument management plan inc incorporated the needs and interests of our stakeholders while providing protections for this important site. I was proud to see it signed into law over four years ago. District 4 of Nevada is also home to two monuments designated by President Obama under the Antiquities Act. Gold Butte National Monument, which covers nearly 300,000 acres of remote desert landscape, protects the cultural history and mining legacy of Southern Nevada. Gold Butte is home to ancient rock art of the Native Americans, important habitat of the bighorn sheep, and a mining ghost town. It offers a truly Western experience for all who visit. Basin and Range National Monument, designated in 2015, preserves a region of scientific importance, ecological significance, and unparalleled beauty. Both monuments are important to my district and are well supported by my constituents. Unfortunately, both monuments were listed to be altered under President Trump's review, a change that would have had significant impacts on my district. These public lands help support our growing outdoor recreation economy, which supports $4 billion in wages and salaries and spurred $12 billion of consumer spending in our state. Nevadans rely on these monuments to protect our unique history and to ensure safeguards for our environment, our communities, and our economy. That is why I oppose the Trump administration's review of our national monuments, and I stand with the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition in its efforts to protect Bears Ears National Monument. Dr. Polly, one argument we often hear is that extractive jobs help local economies more than recreation jobs because they can pay higher salaries. In your experience, um, is this the case? Which jobs remain when the extractive companies leave? And in your estimation, Will the state of Nevada benefit more by protecting its land as national monuments rather than opening its land to industrial explo exploitation? Um, I'm not a jobs expert, but um, the salary for an operator is something akin to a hotel manager. Um, and extractive industries, of course, are short term. Um, you extract the minerals and then you go on. Thank you. And I yield back my time. Much. Mr. Curtis. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member for this important uh, committee. Thank you to our witnesses who have traveled to be here today. Uh, Commissioner Pollock, um, I had the opportunity to serve as mayor before I came to Congress, and uh, we shared property tax with the county and with the city and the school district. Um, you're telling me you get 13 percent of the t of the property tax dollar, and the school district gets the rest. Did I hear that correctly? That's absolutely correct. Uh, what percentage of your land is federal land uh, versus non-federal in the county? Garfield County is the size of the state of Connecticut. Ninety-three percent of that land is federal. Three and a half percent state. Three and a half percent private. So, okay, you, you lost me on those numbers, but somewhere less than 7% actually yields property tax. That's correct. And uh, I'm assuming, like other counties, you're responsible for roads, police, fire, sewer, um, a number of other services. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. All right. So I'm curious, um, when the monument was put into place a number of years ago, how much um, did people care about the economic impact that that would have on a county who struggles to pave roads, to, to pay teachers, to pay police officers. Was that given any consideration? None. No consideration. No local voices were heard. Yeah, and, and that 93% federal land uh, pays uh, payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, any sense of roughly how, what, how that would compare to property tax? Well, we get eighty eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year total for for all of that. That'll last us about sixteen, seventeen days, maybe, running that county. You uh, you talked you made a comment that that I'd like to go back to about um, the fact that these dinosaur um, bones. Um, are not solely dependent on a monument designation to be protected. Could you elaborate on that? Absolutely. Go try to mine coal where there's dinosaur bones. You're not going to do it. The NEPA process won't allow it. Yes. I think one of the paradigms that we've not really addressed today through this hearing and the hearing before is there's this paradigm that without a monument, nothing is protected, no antiquities or the dinosaur bones. And am I correct in saying there's a number of layer of protections in addition to a monument designation? Absolutely. Could you address for a minute, um, as I understand it, when the monument was put into place a number of years ago, there were some promises made about grazing, the impact on grazing. Uh, could you elaborate uh, whether or not those were, were kept and what the current situation is for grazing in the, in the county? Absolutely. And the partners to my right has claimed all along that no AUMs have been lost. That is very complicated because Cattle have been suspended and removed under their process, which allows for them to suspend an AUM. Under the current um, permittee program, I think about half of all the original uh, AUMs have been suspended since 1996, which means there's no hooves on the ground. If you don't have an active AUM, you don't run cattle. So. Don't, don't let me put words in your mouth, but in essence, you don't feel like those promises were kept about grazing in the initial monument. Absolutely not. And one thing about any kind of land management and the BLM, that's what they're all about is to manage the land. You've got to do restoration and recovery projects. That's why the BLM was created in the 30s under the Taylor Grazing Act. And they were not allowed to do that under the heavily regulated process that went forward for 20 years. That's been one of the problems all along. Thank for you. wildlife as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Morris, welcome to Washington. Uh, I suspect this is, this is not your first trip. No, it's my second. Your second trip. Welcome. I hope it's a good experience for you. Um, if I understood your testimony correctly, you, you were given land, your family was given land that was in, in the original monument boundaries. Yes. With, with the reduction, that land came out of those boundaries. Can you tell us the difference in, in your life with your land being in or not in those boundaries? Well, it's made a, a big impact um, with the monument designation alone. Um, we, in our allotments, there's a lot more traffic going in 
And um, our biggest concern is our cemeteries. We have two cemeteries out there, and that's that's our biggest concern now is the traffic. The traffic is more in, in the area, not only the Bears Ears area, but in the Allen Canyon area. I'm, uh, my time has expired. I thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Let me recognize uh, Ms. Holland for her time. Thank you, Chairman. And um, I first wanted to, uh, Ms. Morris, thank you so much for your testimony. I, um, er, the panel we had before you, there were several tribal leaders, uh, one from Utah, one from New Mexico, one from Arizona. And I, I, asked, um, I asked them why, uh, I asked the, um, the Lieutenant Governor from Zuni why he felt, being from a tribe in New Mexico, um, why his voice should be heard on a national monument all the way in Utah. And he stated that uh, for centuries and centuries and centuries, uh, his people had gone on pilgrimages um, to that area. And that um, it actually is, and I visited Bears Ears. I went last September, 20, uh, last September before the election, and realized uh, after hiking many, many canyons and spending you know, three days sleeping outside, it was really wonderful, that um, those are my um, ancestral homelands. Pueblo people lived in the cliffs there. There's evidence uh, that they grew food. Uh, and, and actually, I could say that the bones of my ancestors are buried in bear's ears. And so that gives me, even though I live in New Mexico, that gives me a really, str a very strong, um, I guess, um, idea that I have a say in it also. And so I realized that um, because the United States was all Indian land at one time, a lot of us share the same areas that um, that are under you know conversation right now. So I just wanted to to let you know that I feel very strongly that I have a say in what happens in Bears Ears because my ancestors were there. As evidence shows that they migrated to the Rio Grande Valley in the late 1200s, and uh, and that's where the Pueblo people reside today, with the exception of the Hopi, of course, who also. Uh, feel very tied to Bears Ears. So I thank you for sharing that land with us, and I and I completely um, um, respect the idea that that all tribes who who have a long, long ancestral history uh, with various parts of the land, whether they're still there or not, um, you know, we all have the same purpose, and that is to protect the land. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to uh, to state that uh, my question is for Miss Wagner. I was interested, now New Mexico, we have a lot of national parks and a lots of open space. In fact, two uh, national parks are in my district. The Petroglyph uh, National Park is one of those. And outdoor recreation uh, is billions of dollars in New Mexico. So without those um, national parks and without all of that outdoor recreation, um, we wouldn't have a, we wouldn't, our tourist, uh, um, you know, the tourist money that comes into New Mexico would be greatly diminished. And, and so I, I'm interested in why you think, you know, why do local business owners like yourself support the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument? And, and why do you feel it's important to protect it? Thank you. Um, the Grand Staircase has been in place for 22 years. And under the protections, we felt confident, to, our family felt confident to move to Escalante and invest in a tourism-based business. Um, our uh, transient room tax in the county this year just surpassed $2 million. Uh, and that was a big celebration for all of us in the county. In my town, Escalante, the transient room tax was up 24% in 2017. But it, it's 
it's a lack of imagination just to think that it's all based on tourism. We need so many people in Escalante. We need plumbers. We need carpenters. We need school teachers to come there and teach our children. We need CPAs, all of the services that go along with that type of economy. So there is a great way for people to come live in a beautiful area, be right next door to public lands, and have a life in, that, where they can raise their families. So, so you feel that that trade could be expanded and more people would be able to take advantage of the location and make a good living for them and their families? Absolutely. Thank you. And it looks like I'm out of time, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McClintock, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Commissioner Pollack, uh, this hearing is uh, entitled Forgotten Voices. And the first question I'd have of you were, is um, were your voices actually forgotten or were they deliberately ignored? They were deliberately ignored, absolutely. When I was uh, uh, chairman of the Federal Land Subcommittee, we uh, uh, did a number of field hearings and we heard from a lot of local groups that not only did they feel they were ignored, uh, that they'd been deliberately misled by statements from the Obama administration that uh, uh, restrictive land policies, a land grab if you were, um, weren't even being considered, uh, only to be blindsided uh, when uh, uh, an announcement was made as a fait accompli. What were your experiences with, uh, with these announcements under the Obama administration? Under the Clinton and Obama administration, um, they were dramatic, and let me tell you, when people say that there were forgotten voices in Utah on these two monuments, every member of the House voted on this, the House of Representatives. By an overwhelming majority, they supported a resolution to reduce this size of both monuments. In the Senate, the same thing. The governor signed that. All elected officials, all covered by districts, Senate, House, both commissions, in Garfield County and Kane County did the same thing. We ask a president for the first time in the history of, of Utah that we ask a president to do something, and he did it. And I've heard our good President Trump um, downgraded many times in this hearing, and I want people to remember that. Please remember the fact it was the voices of the state of Utah through the legislative and elected process that ask for this action. And a president actually listened to the great state of Utah. You know, we, we tend to uh, focus a great deal on the policy and process issues, but could you share with us uh, any stories of, of your constituents who have been affected by these land grabs? Absolutely. For 20 years, that's why, and, and, and let me know one thing. I was reelected after it happened. And I'm an at-large commissioner. So overwhelmingly, I was re-elected because the county supported, supported by 95% of the citizens to do this. And the reason is we had several abuses, religious abuses. I mean, we had, uh, I, I, it was brought up several times in the uh, earlier hearing about religion. What about our religion? We used to do uh, pack trails and horse rides down on the monument when I was a kid, the Deacon's Quorum, with the, the good old boys of, uh, of the area. That was taken away from us. That was taken away. So there are several examples like that, and I know we're short on time. So, yeah, there, there's been lots of problems going on locally with the locals over 20 years. That's why we ask for this. It wasn't Leland Pollock or the other two commissioners. It was the people of Garfield County that yeah. asked for this. You know, in medieval times, the British tyrants seized one-third of the land area of uh, England and declared it off-limits to the commoners. It was to be the uh, exclusive province of the crown and its uh, foresters and, and cronies. Um, we set up the American public lands for exactly the opposite purpose. These were to be set aside for the use and enjoyment of the American people. Um, 
One thing that struck me is that uh, uh, our policy uh, under the left seems to be to be moving in the opposite direction, to, to restrict public access to the public lands. Again, uh, uh, when uh, uh, we uh, had the Republican majority, our, our, our chief objective on federal lands policy was to restore public access to the public lands. Uh, how have these edicts uh, restricted your use of the public lands? And by the way, I absolutely support multiple use for everybody. But what happened for 20 years over that span of the, the Clinton monument was it was becoming more and more evident it was going to be single use, only for certain people. Roads were being closed. Um, our cultural heritage, my customs and, and culture and heritage was being taken away. Our traditional use of that land was being taken away and replaced by a single user type Basically, be, you're be, basically being pushed off the public. Absolutely, uh, and I imagine you resent that. Uh, you you might take some comfort in knowing that uh, the actions of the Plantagenet tyrants was was so offensive to the English people that no fewer than five clauses of Magna Carta were devoted to to um, uh, resolving uh, their grievances. And maybe we're heading toward another era. Uh, Mr. Gosar. I thank the chairman. House Democrats are holding a hearing today to protest President Trump's reducing two egregious national monuments in, your, in Utah in order to right-size the two monuments and get them to comply with the legal definition of the smallest area compatible with the proper care of the objects to be protected. President Obama, as you can see from this poster board, locked up 500, five, 553.6 million acres himself designating 66% of all the pie chart that you see here, usurping all other presidents uh, to record. Now let me repeat that. One man with a stroke of a pen locked up 553.6 million acres of land and water. That's 66% of all that's been locked up. Now we're, we're complaining about President Trump right-sizing two, uh, two monuments that's basically 0.337% of that whole process. Now you can't tell me that we all got this right. I mean, I can look at numbers of these monuments from Ironwood to you know what. So we're here for the smallest area compatible with the proper care of objects to be protected. These actions uh, and, and the executive reach as well as the Chairman Bishop's bill will attempt to prevent fixture abuse, future abuse and to fix the outdated 1906 Antiquities Act should be the su subject of today's hearings. If ha House Dems really cared about forgotten voices negatively impacted by actions under the Antiquities Act, they would hold town halls and meetings in state where these egregious land and water grabs occurred, just like Secretary Zinke did when he held 60 meetings with local stakeholders. Now, I've received some communications from other folks who wanted their voice to be heard. Kane County Commissioner Andy Grant. The vast majority of Kane County residents opposed President Clinton's designation of an overtly large Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument back in 1996, just as that same majority of residents now support President Trump's December 2017 scale-down monument. The Clinton action reached out to block underground coal mining of some of the nation's cleanest high BTU coal rather than focusing on protecting specific objects as described in the text of the statute. The majority of local citizens supported coal mining. President Trump's actions to reduce the size of Grand Staircase reflects local sentiment and provides targeted specific protections for the Escalante River drainage while leaving open lands containing coal. On behalf of the people I represent, I believe the most recent use of the Antiquities Act by this president better reflects the views of a vast majority of citizens residing in Kane County today. James Edwards, Conservatives for Property Rights. The Trump administration and the previous Congress worked vigorously and admirably to roll back the Obama land grab, more than half a billion acres. There's nothing honorable about Washington blocking off vast lands. The Obama acolytes need to understand that property rights, productive use of our natural resources, and private ownership are intertwined and must be there if there's to be any benefit, any wealth creation, any human flourishing. Maybe that's the point. This hearing is misguided and a sad reflection of the socialist streak that has overtaken the opposition party. Steve Pierce, Arizona Farm and Ranch Group. National monuments far exceed their original intention of the Antiquities Act to protect our national treasures. 
They are now a tool to add additional layers of bureaucracy and control and limit economic functions on public land. I commend President Trump and former uh, Secretary Zinke in their review of these national monuments. The Arizona Farm and Ranch Group encourage, encourages further review of the Antiquities Act and restoring its true intent, not encouraging massive land grabs that threaten our rural communities. Chairman Grijalva uh, and, and extremist environmentalists have pushed for an Antiquities Act designation in northern Arizona to lock up between a million and 1.7 million acres. Mr. Chairman, I ask to submit testimony and information from a town hall I held in Kingman, Arizona in opposition to the designation of 1.7 million acres in northern Arizona under the Antiquities Act. With no objection, uh, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I also submit to, for comments for the record in opposition to your latest attempt and the million plus acre land grab in northern Arizona through the so-called Grand Canyon Centennial Protection Act. With no objection, so ordered. Yes, one last question. Mr. Pollock, have Garfield County local officials and citizens, citizens ever been properly consulted when it comes to the National Monument designations within your county borders? Yep. President prior to the designation? Prior to Trump, no, we were never. See, this would be wonderful. I'm glad that the ranking member actually sent a letter to the presidents, uh, the previous presidents, to actually ask them what they took into consideration when they did this. It would be nice to have a, a hearing where they actually responded so we could actually understand what took place. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gosar. Mr. Bishop? You're reserving your time, Mr. Chairman? I'm still reserving. Okay. Have the magic unit? No, that doesn't apply to me. Not here. Um, up, you started me on Mount. I'm not going to go on yet. Ms. Morris, <laughs> thanks. Ms. Morris, can you just tell me quickly what are the stewards of San Juan? Stewards of San Juan are um, stockholders, um, local members, um, and um, just community members that got together. Okay. How close do you live personally? Do you live to the Bears Ears Monument? Um, like 45 minutes from Bears Ears. Now, what I get gather from what you were saying is uh, you are part of the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, but also White Mesa, where you live, is a subsection of that tribe. Um, yes. And White Mesa was opposed to this monument, even though the overall tribe headquartered in Colorado supported it. Yes. Was your group, how, how big is the White Mesa? Um, it's about 30 members um, that live in the community. Were they contacted? No. So you are one of those forgotten voices yes. that this is, is actually talking about. I'd like to just read into the record something we put in the record, which Byron Clark was, was quoted in the Deseret News as saying, the more distant you are as a Navajo or tribal member, the more likely you're to support the monument because you view it as an abstraction or concept or theory of tribal sovereignty. The closer you get to the monument, the more likely you are to view it as land that can and should be used properly. That's the situation in which I feel you put yourself. Mr. Yes. Pollock, your testimony, if I get it right, was the AUMs that were promised have not been kept, that the single use that was not, was promised would not, multiple use was promised has not been kept, even though they were in the proclamation, guaranteed. Yeah, absolutely. Broken promises. No, so, they were not kept. The proclamation and what it says really doesn't mean squat. That's right. If we're indeed going to do that, the only way to do that is by legislation. I'm glad Mr. Horse, Horsford was here talking about Tule Springs. We helped him do that, but we did it the right way through legislation. I'll throw up the presence if you could here. Just for an example, except not that one, the other one. 17 presidents have used the Antiquities Act. A better way of saying that is 13 presidents have used the Antiquities Act, three didn't do anything with it, and four abused the Antiquities Act. So if you can see there's a spate of activity that takes place at the original time, the irony is that after World War II, for three decades after World War II, there were only six monuments that were created by six different presidents, and no one complained about them because they were basically small and had a great deal of local support. In the two decades after that, three out of the four presidents did not use the Antiquities Act at all. The only reason we're talking about it now is because four of the last five presidents have abused the Antiquities Act, and the chart shows you how that abuse actually takes place, which once again is going back to the purpose of this hearing. That is why I complimented you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this issue, this hearing. This is within our jurisdiction, and it is significant. 
Have there been forgotten voices? Yes. When these monuments were created, they were forgotten voices. Amada told you also, when monuments that affected the islands were created, they forgot voices. They did not listen to them. The White Mesa group was not listened to even by the Ute Mesa Reservation. Those were forgotten voices. Your constituents, Mr. Pollock, were forgotten voices. Otherwise, Escalante's had 20 years to boom. It certainly hasn't boomed in those 20 years. And it looks very, very negative going forward for, the, for that particular community, which is sad. It's a great community with great people. That is why, Mr. Chairman, we introduced the bill on antiquities. If indeed this hearing is not a sham, and we're just checking off the boxes so special interest groups have a chance to say something. If we are serious and sincere, we will establish with the Antiquities Act a policy, a procedure, and a rule to make sure that voices are heard before a monument is created and that there is a procedure if a monument is ever going to be adjusted. If you look at them at 16 times, monuments have been adjusted by presidents. If you look at that one, Eisenhower even has a negative numbers number by the amount of land he created because he, in, he instituted nine and shrunk the size of six for a negative number system. Gerald Ford was massive in this. He created one monument, all of 87 acres. It is only the last few presidents who have abused this that have created the problem. And that is why we have to adjust the Antiquities Act. And if that is the outcome of this hearing, this hearing will be of use and will not have been in vain. But if we simply ignore it, and we're not talking about how voices can be heard before creation as well as when adjustments take place, then this, is a, this has been a, way, a colossal waste of our time. However, and I hope that's not it. So I thank this panel for being here. I want to thank the earlier panel for being here as well. You came at great distances and expense to do it. It's kind of you to do that. If this produces some kind of language, like my bill, which does come up with a process of rules and procedure, then it will have been worth your time. Otherwise, I apologize that you've come up here in vain. I'll yield back. And I even gave you, oh, damn, I went over. Exactly. I'm not going to quit until you gavel me down. Thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the witnesses uh, for uh, being here, for making the trip and the sacrifice to be here. Your, your, uh, your testimony is important, and it's an important to the deliberations and how we go forward after this hearing. Uh, let me uh, ask uh, some of the witnesses in the second panel. Uh, briefly, Miss um, Croft, briefly, something that you feel you need to uh, tell this committee that hasn't been brought up and hasn't been asked. Uh, sure, yes. I, I want to say that uh, contrary to what uh, Mr. Pollock said, 96.4% of the monument is open for grazing. And according to the BLM's uh, own numbers, the number of AUMs or animals on the ground has only changed, uh, decreased by 0.5%. So to say that the grazing industry has been decimated is, an, is false. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wagner, same offer. Well, yeah. Uh, yes, I was thinking also that uh, the populations are of Escalante School, all the other uh, gateway schools in the monument, their populations are stable. My, my grandson is in the preschool, and there's 18 kids in the preschool in Escalante. So I think that's on the rise. Something's on the rise around there. So uh, I think, you. you know, with the industry that's being formed and the people that are coming in invest, investing, I don't think it's a dying community. I think it's a thriving community. Thank you very much. And uh, same same uh, question, uh, Dr. Pollock? Um, yes, I'd like to pick up on the question of protection. Um, the importance of a monument isn't that it protects fossils, um, because PRPA protects fossils on all public land. The importance of a monument is it prioritizes scientific research. Um, for paleontology, um, Grand Staircase Escalante is very much like a scientific institute or a cyclotron or something like that for other disciplines, and it's that added value that comes from being a monument and the prioritization that's important for science, um, not just simply the protection. Um, in fact, if you look at a monument like um, Fort McHenry, um, the, the site of the Star Spangled Banner, um, we don't just put a fence up around it, um, we actually cultivate it. We keep the buildings restored, we make sure that it's um, available and that that resource is prioritized, and so too does the Grand Staircase Escalante do that for paleontology. 
Thank uh, again. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. And, and in closing, just let me say that a couple of things in uh, in reaction to some of the testimony and some of the comments by uh, my colleagues on, on this committee. Uh, the Antiquities Act is not broken. Uh, if we begin with the premise that, that that is the fundamental fault here, then uh, we're missing the point A of the hearing and B where we need to go from this hearing. Number two, I think that the purpose now is to continue to look very closely at the decision-making process that reached the conclusion that we needed to revoke or alter the original designations, monument designations that were made by President Obama. That is the legal challenge, that, and in my mind, that is both the constitutional and legal challenge that needs to proceed. And at the crux and at the center of this is, is the fact that this decision-making process left out stakeholders, voices weren't heard, and uh, basic processes, including tribal consultation, were never as robust as necessary as they should have been in order to get uh, a real, uh, the real opinion and the real collaboration of, of, of Native nations in this discussion. And we're talking about a process that's ongoing right now and efforts to reach out. That is after the fact after the decision was made to shrink, and now we're talking about management plans for a significantly smaller and uh, le less significant uh, designation that President Trump made. How we reached this decision, the role of Secretary Zinke, the role of Acting Secretary Bernhardt, the role of the uh, EPA Administrator Wheeler are all part of the discussion going forward. Because if we let a decision stand that was preconceived and decided on before uh, any process came into place, then we are allowing what are basic protections around the Antiquities Act and basic public process and transparency to, to continue. How we got here, how this decision was made, the role people play, it is my firm belief that this was a predestined outcome and then everything that has occurred since then has been to justify that outcome. And I don't think it's justifiable, and we will continue to proceed uh, to make sure that the transparency and the public's right to know is uh, part and parcel of the discussion going forward. And any reforms and any legislation uh, to try to make this situation whole is something we'll be exploring in the near future. With that, let me adjourn, and thank you very much.